ends, we're going to talk about the learning modality um, of education in the district. We're going to review a, a first review of budget materials. Um, first, I'd like to assign a meeting evaluator. Do I have a volunteer to do that work? Gotcha, we'll do it. Thank you. All right, and before we get started, I'd like to vote um, to appoint Megan Salt, Salt is the way, right? To our, uh, replace Paul Putney as our Randolph representative. She, uh, her resume was uh, approved at the Randolph Select Board meeting. She would fill a seat vacated by Paul um, that will be up for re-election in March. So, do I have a motion to approve Meg Salt uh, to be our Randolph representative? I make the motion we approve Meg Salt to be our Randolph representative on the board. I second that motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, welcome and congratulations. Thank you. And it's perfect, you get six months to decide whether you like it. <laughs> <laughs> then you can decide, so that's good. All right, um, next, we do have some time for public comment right now, which I will open it for public comment. I also want to let you know that we're gonna review and discuss ENDS and learning modality, and there will be public comment, time for public comment after that, as well as after our um, discussion of the budget. So, um, we're getting comments that people can't hear. Yeah, I think Lane is uh, okay. Okay, uh, Lane is working on the hearing. We're sort of muffled. If not, we'll have to switch over to just using computers. Okay. All right. Um, so as I was trying to say before, um, this is a time for public comment. If anyone would like to make a comment right now, um, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Um, we will have time later in the meeting for public comments left. can't hear us um, because that's I know so annoying all right next um, we are going to review and discuss ends and that lane is uh, up to you so we'll start off talking a little bit about where where we're at where we're headed with the ends this year remembering that SBAC um, and a lot of the testing data including a lot of the ACT and the SAT um, data is not available because it didn't happen last year. Um, so what we are doing right now is we are converting over um, and we are going to be using our Track My Progress and our Star 360 data um, that the staff uh, Track My Progress they've been collecting for two or three years now so we'll have some longitudinal data there. Um, Star 360 is new this year um, so that'll be baseline um, data for the upper grades uh, at the high school. Um, that should be available um, for the November meeting um, today in lieu of that richer discussion about student performance. What we can talk about is we'll talk about student enrollment and we'll talk about, um, take a look at the homeschool data, um, especially given the, the crisis that we're kind of facing. So give me a moment to pull up the uh, report here. I'm going to switch it over to the presentation. All right, can you guys see this? On your screens, should have a PowerPoint to set. Yeah. 
Now, you see in the presentation? Yeah. Yes. Right. Let's talk a little bit about this. So these are the enrollment numbers that we're going to talk about across the, the schools in the district, um, as well as the district as a whole. We'll take a look at special education numbers, kind of as a little bit of a, a review from, from last month. Um, and we'll take a look at them over the last four to five years. Um, and again, the big thing to keep an eye out for um, is this current year, 2021. Um, because that's going to give us an indication of things that may be happening around COVID. And we'll talk a little bit about this data and how it kind of meshes in with the homeschooling data that we're going to look at. If you look at the total enrollment um, at Braintree Elementary, um, you'll notice going back to 2016-2017, to right, it started off with 81 students, um, slowly built up to 96, and then we looks like we lost about 20 of them um, between last year and this year. Um, so it's been on the rise mostly. Um, even the trend line right now, if you go across those years, is still up a little bit. What I did in this graph is I took the same data and I've normalized it. And by that, what I mean is that I took a look at the number of students that started homeschooling when COVID started in March. And I added those numbers back into last year's data and this year's data. And you still see that uh, Braintree has had a drop, but it's nowhere near as significant um, as it was before we normalized it. As a matter of fact, they are still on a pretty healthy um, trend line in terms of growth. And you guys here can stop me anytime you want to ask questions. Is the concern that they be down to Oh, that I don't know anything about. Um, the other thing that we could do is we could shut the owl off and go back to just use an iron. Use an iron or local laptop. So what this means is um, you only turn your mic on in here when you're speaking. Okay. And then um, the only speaker that will be open will be mine. Let me switch, give me a second to switch over. That may help. Give me a moment, folks. I apologize. All right. Let's give this a try. Let me turn my speaker way up so everybody can hear people out there and talking. All right, can you still see the presentation? Okay. So brain tree enrollment, this is what it's normalized again. It's adding back in the people that dropped off um, starting in March, um, presumably due to uh, reaction to COVID. In terms of Brookfield, right? Um, started off in 2018 with 60 students. We were up to 76 last year. Um, in the midst of COVID, we're down to 71, but they still have a pretty good growth rate of um, they're adding about two students per year um, over the entire time period that you're looking at. If we normalize it, um, it gets a little bit better, right? Um, they're actually adding, uh, once it's normalized, about 3.1 students per year. And the growth is still trending upwards. Randolph Elementary um, had the highest number of students that chose to go uh, to homeschool this year. Um, so you can see they've kind of bounced around. They're at a, a low, a five-year low right now of 270 students, um, and they're trending downward. If we normalize the data, however, um, they're still down about 10 students from last year, um, but the trend line across the five years is still slightly going up. Um, again, it's hard to anticipate, it's hard to predict what the impact of COVID has been um, in terms of uh, enrollments and the decisions that people are making to either have their students in school or out of school. Um, but you can see in all the cases that we look at, there was a clear trend upwards until we got close to COVID, right? Affected two years, affected the end of last year when people started to choose to homeschool, and then it definitely affected this year. 
Randolph Union High School before it was normalized. Um, they actually are, are doing pretty well. Um, you know, before it's normalized, the trend line is down a little bit, but we actually have additional students than we had last year, even despite COVID. And then we, when we add in the people that chose to homeschool since uh, COVID started, you know, we've actually got a pretty a strong um, trend line going up. Um, so again, across the district, the, the trends in terms of that goal to increase enrollment, it's not rising as fast as we'd hope, but we've got two years of quirky going on. Um, and uh, sorry about that, I was getting noises, didn't know what it meant. Um, something quirky going on, but we're still in pretty good shape. Um, whereas most of the state of Vermont, the enrollments are declining. In terms of uh, total enrollment across the district before we normalize it, um, right, we tend to hover somewhere, and this does not include um, uh, preschool, uh, we tend to hover somewhere between 830 and 850. Um, we're at a low now, again, not normalized data of 805, again, due to COVID. But if we normalize it, you know, the district trend line is up. We're adding about six or seven kids a year. Um, we add those numbers back in. So questions on any of the school or the district total data? Again, big focus, um, and we spoke about this a, a year or two ago, um, is this idea that districts in Vermont survive or fail depending upon enrollment. As the enrollments go out the door, every student that walks out the door is a loss of $10,300 to $10,600 um, in money from the education fund that's paid for by everybody across the state. Um, and over time, that can add up significantly. And then schools get into this problem and districts get into this problem of having to start to cut programs and start to cut staff as those enrollments go down. And then you set up this cycle that kind of reinforces itself as we cut programs, as we cut staff, the quality of education isn't what it used to be. And then enrollments tend to go down even more. And so we've been trying to reverse that trend. As we build enrollments, as we get more students coming into the district through school choice, um, through hopefully people moving in, um, then what happens is we can kind of reverse those trends. We're able to build programs, um, be able to kind of improve the instruction that we offer. And then hopefully that's a bigger draw for, for parents and it, it builds on itself over time. Total number of IEP students. Um, we talked about this um, extensively uh, at the last uh, board meeting. Um, they are on the rise um, in this district and they are rising dramatically. Um, we're getting about 10 more per year across the entire district. And as a percent of our total district population right now, um, our IEP students are 22.3% of the entire district population. The state and national average is somewhere between 12 and 14%. So one of the reasons that we had this strong focus uh, at the elementary level in terms of revamping how service delivery um, is offered to those students. One of the reasons that focus was so important is because we got to reverse this trend. We got to begin giving those students the skills to be independent um, so that over the course of time, they're on more, less and less restrictive IEPs and eventually come off their IEPs. And we need to keep working on that until we hit that threshold goal of about the national or the state average somewhere between 12 and 14%. Um, so there's a lot of restructuring going on to kind of address uh, this problem. Because of this, the special education budget is up about 37% over the last two years. Um, so it is, um, takes quite a bit uh, to, to serve, serve these students. And if we're gonna be spending that kind of money, then dang it, we should be serving them well. Um, serving them well enough that they're gaining their independence or eventually coming off their IPs. So questions at all in terms of district enrollment? So, uh, oh. well, I think it might be coming from that thing. I just shut my own mic off. Uh, well, I'm just sort of curious. So uh, we said we were talking about ends, but our ends are about what you're going to accomplish for a district in terms of students having the skills to get to the next stage of their life, 
how does enroll, I mean, you sort of said how enrolling helps that, but I guess I don't, well, it just seems like Vermont in general, all of these schools are, are losing students. I think that might be something you might want to pay attention to, but I would, as a, I would prefer that our attention be more on the students we have now and, and again, trying to get them the skills that they need so that when they finish in our system, they're ready to, to take the next steps toward where they want to go. Um, so if you want to spend time on trying to market and promote our schools, that's great. I think it's great that you're trying to make sure that our IEP students have the skills and are gaining the skills. Um, but I just don't want to lose sight of the ultimate goal, which is to have those skills in place for the students that are here now. Whether or not we can entice people to come to Vermont seems like, or into our district, seems like a difficult Thing, and I'm not sure, not sure how much effort we ought to be putting into that versus trying to, to make these ends happen for the students that are here. So in terms of this, this would go back. That, this goes back to the adaptability end, right? We are trying to survive in a difficult environment, in an environment where enrollments are going down. The way to survive is to try to prevent those enrollments from going down. And I'm in 100% agreement with you um, on the ends piece and on, because that's the performance piece, right? If we serve the students here well, the school gets a good name. We start getting students coming in from other districts under school choice. So it's not so much necessarily about having to move to the state, but it's about having students choose to go here when they, especially when they hit that high school level and they have the choice to go anywhere they want under Vermont law. And we've actually been doing a very good job of that. We had, I believe last year, it was either 35 or 37 students that were here under school choice. And those students brought in around $350,000 of additional money that we were able to use to improve our programs that we didn't have to go directly to the taxpayers in the town um, for the funding of. Um, the performance um, piece uh, in terms of academic performance, like I said at the outset, um, we'll be talking about that in November. Um, because at the beginning of the year, uh, we geared up those assessment systems for a couple of reasons. Um, one, we had to find out what the students had lost um, during the remote session last year, so that if they had some real significant deficits and skills and uh, knowledge, we had to build that in at the beginning of the year before we could build on it with a new curriculum. Um, two was also to be able to provide the board with some meaningful ends data. And that data is kind of neat because it ties directly into um, SBAC. We've kind of scaled it as such so that it kind of has the same meaning. Um, as that you would see with the, the SPAC scores. Um, in front of you, I was going to talk about this a little bit, but just to make lives a little bit easier. Um, and I apologize that folks at home won't have this, but that colored sheet there, that is the strategic plan based upon the ends the district is working on, has been working on for the last two years or so. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you are. Okay, thank you. Um, Lane, how many students do we have this year that have left the Randolph school system for school choice to go somewhere else? And did we see that number change from last year? So the last time I looked at that data, which was earlier this year, I believe it was three or four, which is down from previous years. Again, we've got some good trends that are going on. They're not happening as fast as we'd like. And of course, we don't know the impact of COVID over the last two years has had on this. But you see there was a, before COVID hit, there was a solid three years across the district of things doing this. And a lot of that um, was school choice students um, that came in. We've had some move-ins from the outside, primarily to Braintree, uh, but that's kind of been after the, the COVID piece, people are moving here to telecommute. Um, and, and for some reason, they're, they're picking Braintree to do that. Um, but everything is going in the right direction. It was a very low number. Um, like I said, I think the last time we talked about it was two or three. 
Yeah, which is good. I think it was, maybe it was Brian that it remarked, geez, we got that many kids that are coming in from the outside. I think it was a surprise to somebody on the board. I remember them making that, that remark. Um, it was 30, 35 or so last year. Yep. So good questions. Um, all right, let's go over to the homeschool data. This one's, a, as I'm getting kind of settled in and getting used to the fog on my glasses. Um, give me just a second to pull this up. Homeschool enrollments. Am I still in presenter mode? Are you guys seeing this? Perfect. So this is as of October 2020. Um, and we're going to look at the schools first. So there's a couple of weird things here I want you to notice. There's actually two lines. There's the blue and there's the orange. Um, the blue dots represent the total number of students, at, in this case, in, at Braintree Elementary um, that are homeschooling right now. So you'll see in 2021, which is this current year right now, there are five. The orange dots represent how many people are new since COVID. So in the case of 2021, and I'll normalize this anyway, you can see there, there are five this year, four of them are new um, this year, probably due to COVID. So that means had it not been for COVID, we probably would have had one, one homeschooler at Braintree. Okay. Does that make a little bit of sense? If we normalize this, if we take a look at where things stand and kind of pull out the new additions due to COVID, you can see that the number of students that are choosing, parents that are choosing to homeschool at Braintree has been going down. How significant is this? I'd like to say it's really significant, but these are small numbers to start. I mean, right, the highest number on there is three. Um, so they tend to hover around the, 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 the two to three range, um, tends to be the norm. In terms of uh, Brookfield, right, again, blue line is telling you the total number of students that are homeschooling. The orange dots are telling you the total number of students that are new since COVID. So in 2020, that's new since March. Uh, 2021, that's new this, since the start of this school year. Now, these numbers may fluctuate a little bit. They may change. Um, the state as a whole had a huge number of applicants for homeschool, um, and they are still, I think, a month and a half behind in processing them. Um, what they do do, though, at least, is they give us um, the number of applicants that haven't been processed yet, and this number is based on, on that. If we take out the ones that are new since COVID, um, this is the trend uh, for homeschooling in Brookfield. Again, how significant is it? Well, you know, they were starting off around six kids homeschooling. You know, technically, they'd, they'd be down to one right now um, if it weren't for COVID. Um, so it is in the right direction, but again, it's a small population of students. Randolph Elementary School. Again, blue is total. Orange is new since COVID. When you normalize it, um, they're a little more steady state. Um, you know, they are decreasing um, the number of homeschool students um, over the trend line that is here. But there has been an increase um, this current year that seems unrelated to COVID, even after we normalize. RUHS. This one is actually very interesting. Um, right? Again, blue, total number right now. Orange is what's been added since COVID. If we normalize it, things are going in the right direction. You know, they started off in uh, 2017, 2018 with about 25 students out that were homeschooling. Um, they are now down to around 12. So they've cut their numbers in half. So again, we talk about education and drawing families in. Um, for the most part, people are becoming more satisfied, I think, with the education that's offered across the district at the whole, which is why we've been seeing over those three years, we saw those increases in enrollment and we're seeing a decrease in homeschooling. So questions on homeschool. Oh, sorry about that. It'll, it'll beep when you try to sign back in. Are too quiet. Either that or I was completely nonsensical and 
So in terms of um, these pieces, they're not an actual end goal, um, but for me, what they, they do two things. They are a minor goal, but to me, they are a reflection of the overall quality of what we're providing to parents, which does relate to the ends, right? If people are happier with the education their students are getting, they're more likely to hang around. We're more likely when people are making choices um, about where to send their kids, we're more likely to be chosen. SBAC has been a little problematic in the district. Um, I think you're gonna be pleased when the, we look at the Track My Progress and the Star 360s data next year. Tra uh, SBAC's been a little problematic for a couple of reasons. Um, one, um, for a long time, um, it was not a focus of the district, right? It was not something that folks, I believe, were too, too concerned about. Um, it was very hard. It's been a cultural shift um, to get uh, teachers, not all, but, but some of the teachers a little bit more serious about it, um, especially during the administration um, of those assessments and to get the kids to be serious about it. Um, so there's a little bit of lag time between having them take, take those exams seriously um, and you know, being able to rely on them for accurate results. But the track my progress is a little bit different because the kids have kind of grown up with that now, um, in a sense. And so, you know, they've taken it just the way they do any other assignment, any other work that they do during the school day. So it should be much more representative um, of what's going on. So questions. Let me get the big one coming up next. Lane, yep. would you share your, the four goals that um, you gave us, knowing they were priority as, as you presented them as the OSSD ends plan? I think those are important for people to know. Yeah, so the, the ends, and again, I've got the document, I'll get it up on the website. Um, we've been talking about it a little bit um, in uh, the cabinet meeting. Um, you know, it's the stuff that we've been working on for a couple of years now. Um, it's just we finally things have gotten to the point where we can start to really put the ideas down in writing. The reason that I haven't shared this um, widely at this point in time is because under the identified gap, that has last year's a year year old data in it because we didn't get new SBAC data. So things are significantly different now than they were a year ago. And so I'd rather kind of wait um, a little bit um, before putting this up until we get the new data in there. Um, but I'll, I'll put it up anyway. I may, may take that out because I don't want people confusing that with, um, with our, our, our current state. But we basically have four goals that we've been working on the district. And um, two, three of them, excuse me, relate right back to the board's um, foundational knowledge ends. And one of them relates to adaptability as well as foundational knowledge. Um, so in order of priority, um, the first goal that we are working on and have been working on for the last couple of years is decreasing the number of students on IEPs as a percentage of the overall student population. And the threshold that we're shooting for is we want to be within 1% of the state or the national norm, which is around 14%. So we want to at least get down to the 13 to 15% range before we can say we've done a good job. Doesn't mean that we're going to stop trying to make it better than that, but it does mean that that's the goal that we're shooting for and we need to start making progress on. Major structures are going into place this year. Last year was planning, was thinking about it, was getting the plan in place, was trying to get people on board. Um, we did some structural changes. There were paraprofessionals that were laid off so that we could shift those resources to hiring more special education teachers. At the elementary school this year, they are moving um, to a cohort model um, from a case management model, um, which should have an impact. Um, that was chosen because when we looked around the state, that was the model that seemed to be having the most positive impact in the schools um, where it was, was put into place. And so again, lot going on there um, to try to, uh, to to try to improve this. We also spent a lot of time, and I give the special education team a tremendous amount of credit, um, developing a rubric um, that you will have the baseline data from for the first time um, in November. And what that rubric is, is it's putting a number that 
is showing how restrictive a student's IEP is. Oh, if I've got a five, that's really restrictive. If I've got a one, that's the least restrictive we could have and still have an IEP. So you've got a range of numbers there and we can add up students in a grade, we can take an average and then we can use those numbers to see how things are changing over time to determine if what we're doing is having an impact in the right direction the way that we want it to. Um, the other data that we are collecting um, is literally the number of students on IEPs, how many are coming off each year. That one gets a little more difficult. Um, all this data is a little bit difficult with special education. Um, first, because we've constantly got students moving in and constantly have students moving out. And I don't want to penalize in the data our staff who may be doing really, really good work, but all of a sudden get 20 kids that move in that are on really restrictive IEPs, right? We've got a system in place to try to, to, try to normalize that data a little bit. We also have a way of kind of tracking um, the data that uh, Crystal is pulling together is also tracking the number of years that students have been on an IEP with us, right? Because if they've only been with us for a year, you know, you should expect some improvements, but not a lot. If they've been with us for six years on a pretty restrictive IEP, then darn it, we should be seeing some really, really good improvement. So there's a lot of parts and pieces there that we're taking a look at that'll give us some insight um, into the nuances behind uh, working with special education students. This is data that hasn't been collected before as well. So it might require some adjustment. We might start digging into it and find out that, hey, you know, it's not telling us quite what we need to know for where we're trying to get, and so we may need to adjust it. But it's a very good start. It was very logical. It was very well thought out, the work that was done. Um, so I'm, I'm very proud of the work, work um, that the special education team has been engaged in. Um, so that one then plays into both adaptability, right? Are students able to adapt and be successful? Um, but it also plays into um, all the foundational eds, uh, ends, because if the students have the skills to learn on their own independently without needing a significant amount of intervention, they are going to be much better able to achieve the foundational knowledge ends than if they weren't. Goal two, now we get into the foundational knowledge ends, English language arts. High priority, increase the number of students achieving proficiency on the ELA Smarter Balanced Assessment um, Consortium. What are we shooting for? Across the district, on average, we want 70% of the students in the district to be crossing the proficiency threshold. Um, I think it was Ian asked at the last meeting, you know, um, why 70%? Well, the reality is under No Child Left Behind, what percent are we supposed to be achieving? 100. 70% is reasonable step for now, given where we're starting, given the structures we're putting into place, uh, given the funding that we have to support this work. And when we hit that 70% threshold consistently, then we'll take a step back and see what more we can do. But the goal set on us by the federal government is 100%. That's what No Child Left Behind means. Why English language arts? Why is that a higher priority than say math or science? Because you have to be able to read for understanding and write for purpose to be able to be successful in all your other courses. Fundamental, foundational. Mathematics, same deal. We want 70% to be hitting that proficiency threshold on the SBAT, right? Federal government says it needs to be 100%, but given the resources that we have, the structures we've been able to build over the last year or two, 70% is reasonable. Once we get there, we can take a step back and kind of reassess, see what else we need to push it further. The other reason that these are important is because they are high visibility. When people look that are moving in potentially from out of town or they're looking at schools across the state, this is the data that they see, right? SBAC, it's published out there by school, by district. They look at math, they look at ELA, and hopefully they'll be looking at science um, now that they've kind of switched around to the Vermont Science Assessment. Um, but ELA and math are key. The last one um, that we are currently working on right now is science. And again, the only difference between this and the ELA and the math is we're trying to get 70% of the students across the proficiency threshold on that Vermont science assessment. Again, this one does not have a federal government telling us that we need to be at 
but we want our students to perform equally um, across those three areas as a start. Now, the board's ends um, play into a couple of other parts and pieces. There's a fine arts, there's three or four other ends there. The reason that we chose these is because they all need work and significant work. Can't do them all at once. These are the most visible. These will have the most impact on students' ability to be successful in the other ends. Once we hit that 70% threshold across the board on these three, I'm gonna to come to this school board and say, is this enough? And your job is gonna to be to either tell me, yes, 70% is good, keep it there, try to push it a little higher, but we're satisfied with 70. And if you do that, then these will stop being a priority and I will start to pick up the other ends and start to work on the district um, and the cabinet with it. If you say no, no, you know, the federal government has backed off a little bit on it on the last reiteration of No Child Left Behind, but we're still interested in, in trying to get that 100% that or as close to it as possible. This is where we want you to focus, then we stay on these for now. The other areas will improve a little bit just by the fact that students are improving on these foundational skills. Math is foundational to other disciplines. ELA is foundational to almost all other disciplines. Science helps you practice both math and ELA, plus learn some interesting things, depending upon how it's structured and if it's structured well. So those are the ends pieces that we'll be taking a look at next week. So questions, thoughts? Too quiet. Again, hopefully I'm not, I'm, I'm making a little bit of sense. It's been a long day, but. I, I have a question. The next subject for discussion um, will be the learning modality. And Lane, this is again you presenting um, how you and the cabinet have discussed since phase three reopening um, a couple of weeks ago. How have you decided to move forward and for what reasons? So we'll talk, we'll spend a little bit of time on this. I know that, that folks are interested, which is awesome. Um, I know there's been a lot of discussion on Facebook, which I don't follow. I don't have a Facebook account, which is why I'm glad there's so many folks here and hopefully we'll get some good questions that come out of this. Let me see if I can get this up and running. And we'll talk about kind of the things that we look at, things that we're concerned about, um, things that are good, um, and things that will change if we make a determination um, to go to um, full in-person learning. Can you guys see the presentation that's up there? Yeah. All right. So a couple of basic things um, when we're looking at a system, um, especially one that has the potential to have poor outcomes, um, is there's two types of factors. There's protective factors and there's risk factors, um, and they both play into probability. Protective factors are pretty simple. Um, conditions and behaviors that reduce the possibility of a poor outcome. Risk factors increase the probability that a poor outcome will occur, right? Now, the thing about probability, these are all probabilities, it doesn't mean it has to happen. You can have a high probability that something is going to occur and it doesn't have to happen. And that's what makes all this tricky, right? So in my case, in our case, when we discuss this, I'm always looking to play the odds in our favor. Okay? It's about probability. It's not about fear. It's about what's likely to happen. Doesn't mean it has to, but it's about what's likely to happen. The protective factors um, that we have in place right now under our current learning modality. Learning modality is, is how we're presenting um, teaching to kids. Right now we're in a hybrid learning. They're learning remotely a couple of days a week. They're in person a couple of days a week. On the health and sanitation side, it's allowing us to maintain that six feet of social distancing. This includes on the buses. Um, we've been lucky, right, when we've only got about 40% of the kids coming into school on each of the in-person days that a lot of the parents are actually dropping their kids off. Um, so there are very few students right now on the buses, which is good because those can be some pretty cramped quarters. Um, there's mask wearing, right, which is required. Um, that's an easy protective factor. We're doing daily health screenings when the kids walk in the door. They are finding that temperature, which is a major component of these health screenings, um, is not as reliable as they thought. 
Um, so that one's a, a, an iffy one. Hand washing routines are in place at all schools. That helps. Um, we do have well-maintained and functioning ventilation systems. A lot of work was done this summer to get them working optimally. And not only that, but to increase their filtration ability. We've got the MERV 13 filters in there. So as the uh, air is passing through them, they strain out particles that are small enough um, not to catch the coronavirus, but to, co to catch the aerosols that the coronavirus attaches to the aerosols that we breathe out, right? We have increased the disinfection cycles in the schools. They happen three times a day. The physical structures that we have in place, and this is gonna be important a little bit later in the conversation, is we've been able to build these learning pods. Um, this is true at the high school. There's about five of them at the high school. These are isolated groups of students that work together in a pod, in a, in a, in a group with the same teachers so that they're not intermixing with the rest of the schools. This doesn't necessarily prevent transmission. What it does is it prevents spread, right? If a student comes in and is infected and is pot in pod one, then pod one students get affected, not the other four pods that are happening at the high school, right? So it's to reduce the overall impact if, if we do have an outbreak here. The other thing, and I have it in blue, is the ability to teach outside. That's a protective factor because the ventilation is better. Of course, the reason it's in blue is because that's changing, right? We're getting into the colder weather. We've been hitting in the 30s at night, last couple of nights. Um, and it's getting colder outside. So at the very beginning of the year, it was great. I'd go around to the elementary schools and they'd be outside all day teaching. They got a lot of neat little learning areas they're set up. Not happening as much anymore because um, you just can't. Um, and right now under the current structure, we have enough staff to safely manage students. By managing students, I mean, hey, your mask is a little bit down. Can you pull that up, please? Hey, you guys are a little bit close. Can you spread apart, right? It takes a lot of interactions. The kids are, are doing a great job, but by managing students, it's making sure that they're following through on those health and sanitation guidelines um, that are a part of all this. Um, and then the other piece that's a protective factor across Vermont right now, it's, um, it's changing a little bit as it is across the nation. We do have a very low rate of infection in our immediate surrounds. Right? In terms of risk factors, we have a couple of things that are unique uh, to our district, right? First thing is that we've got the tech center here that takes in students from nine different sending schools. So when we're trying to preserve these students in pods and trying to keep the mix down and trying to keep um, as many kind of people that aren't in those pods out of the buildings, um, it's a little bit difficult, right? Because we've got students coming in from all across central Vermont. That are coming into our buildings on a daily basis. We also have those 30, 35 school choice students um, that are coming in. Great for our enrollment numbers and helping us out in terms of our tuitions that are coming in. Um, but again, it's increasing the risk uh, because these are entities from outside our local area. Now, there has been a reduction of restrictions across the state and the nation. That's a risk factor. Right? Anytime you open things up, you're exposing people to more risk, the probability goes up that you are going to have an event. One of the biggest things that happened to us lately, um, which is I think is awesome, um, is athletics, right? They moved us to phase three, and so now we can have athletic events, but now we've got more mixing. Now we're not just you know, having students mixing from central Vermont, we've got students potentially coming in from all over the state for these events. Um, the other thing um, in terms of a risk factor right now at the two or three events that I was at, I want to give the parents in the community a lot of credit because 95% of the people were wearing masks and doing what they needed to at those events, but there was about 5% that weren't. Again, it's outside, that's, that lowers, that's a protective factor, but when you got 150 people all crowded together watching a game and some aren't wearing masks, it adds to the risk. The recent move to step three um, that happened, step three for the state of Vermont is the least restrictive step in the state. Um, it's left people with what I'll call a reopening mentality. Um, and again, this is my personal take on it. People can disagree with me and I will respect that. But what I've seen happening is I look across the country and, and states are reopening. Right? They start off with some things that are fairly innocuous and then they move on to, to things that are a little bit heavier, a little bit riskier. And what do they do? 
they reopen this and they reopen that and they keep reopening until all of a sudden they get an outbreak. And then what happens, right? They either go back to square one or they just say, hey, we're gonna stay here because this is an acceptable rate of infection, okay? So for me at least, and again, these are just my recommendations. I do not have the power to tell people what they should or should not do. That's a board decision. The board reserved that to itself. For me, at least when I look at it, it doesn't make sense to play Russian roulette and keep pulling the trigger until the chamber goes off and then you decide what you're gonna do. To me, it makes sense to find a nice balance of risk and protection and maintain that until something significant changes in the world outside. Um, the world has not changed outside that much since March when everything went into close down, except that we're back up to 50,000 cases a day in, this, in the country. The cases in the state have actually gone up a little bit too, but our case rates are so low, you know, it, you know going from you know, zero to two a day to six to 11 a day, you know, it doesn't sound like much, but it has gone up in the state over the last week. The other piece that has been concerning, and this is a risk factor in this school, and I want the parents to take this message um, because it's important. A lot of people are doing what they need to do. We have a lot of parents that are traveling on the weekends to hotspots, Boston, New York, further afield, and they are coming back to school and not sending their kids to school and not going through the mandatory quarantine period that is required by the state of Vermont. How do we know? Because we see it on their Facebook pages. We ask the kids, the kids tell us the truth. Or in one case, the parents said, no, that's an old Facebook post, we didn't go. And the grandparent picks up the kids and says, what are you talking about? They were there all weekend. Those are risk factors, okay? And we've gotta do a little bit better about it. And we've gotta do a little bit better about that and the mask wearing at the, the sporting events too. Um, in my, my opinion, you know, if we're gonna be looking at bringing clusters and clusters of kids back. Finally, winter is coming. Because of that, all of us, um, including the students, will be spending more time inside. This is a coronavirus and the health professionals can correct me if I'm wrong, but coronaviruses are seasonal. Usually the lowest rate of infection for coronaviruses occurs in September. And then it starts to increase through February. And then it gets the highest rate in February and then it starts to decrease after that back down to a low the next September. We are also getting ready to enter into the holiday and vacation travel season, which happens at the same time that infection rates for coronaviruses tend to go up. All folks will be spending more time indoors around here just because of the weather. And like I said, cases have been rising nationally since mid-September. I don't know much about the death rates yet because it usually takes, there's about a month lag time between when, you know, people get infected and the, the death, if it occurs, is reported. Okay, so risk factors and things to kind of consider. If we switch to full in-person instruction, right, I'm going back to the protective factors that we talked about. The ones in red and yellow are the ones that we will lose. So we have protective factors that we have put into place that if we go back to full instruction, full in-person instruction, we will lose, right? So the balance of those skills will switch. One of the reasons that we chose the hybrid schedule out of the gate was because in most classrooms, there are a couple of elementary classrooms where this is not true, but in most classes, if we have all the students back, we will not be able to maintain six feet of social distancing. And I cannot imagine how close the students will be on the buses. Social distancing is the prime protective factor for this disease. Physical structures, those pods we talked about, those will disappear, right? All the students will be back. We're gonna to have to redo the, the master schedule for the high school, which is fine. It'll take about a week to do, but all those students will be mixing. So it means that if we do get an exposure here, we're not just exposing a smaller group of students were potentially exposing the whole school. Instead of exposing potentially 60 students, we're now gonna be exposing 300 plus, potentially. The ability to teach outside is going away, right? Because it's getting colder, we're entering winter. 
And then we have the question um, that's been out there for a long time is, will we have enough staff if we go back to full in-person instruction to be able to safely manage the students? Even under the hybrid schedule, we have had 10 resignations since the start of this school year. Okay. Um, mostly paraprofessionals and custodial staff, but we've had a teacher or two as well. And it is expected because people are anxious and people are nervous that if we go back to full in-person instruction, that that is going to accelerate. Can't guarantee it, high probability it will. We also, to add worries to this as part of the staffing piece, we haven't been able to get substitute teachers, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But right now we've got multiple people out with symptoms, right? Cold and flu season is on us, it's coming up. As people get those symptoms, they mimic COVID, so you don't know, so they can't be here. How long are they typically out? Well, in a normal year, they might be out a day or two until the symptoms start to sub subside. In most cases now, they're out at least three to five days, in most cases, seven days. It takes seven days in a negative COVID test, right, to be able to return. So we're now amplifying right, our problems with staff, because as they get normal sicknesses that normally would have taken them out of school maybe for a day or two because they don't know if it's COVID, we've now probably doubled or tripled the number of absences that we're gonna see this year. Again, you guys can interrupt and jump in any time because I think it's an important um, conversation. I'm gonna give my recommendations at the end. A lot of people have asked me what my concerns have been. Um, and I've talked about the concerns, but I haven't talked about what my recommendations are. Um, operational considerations um, to be considerate of if we move to full in person. Again, we just talked about that. The schools are tightly staffed. We currently do not have enough subs. We've already had to shut down the preschool because when the teacher was absent, we couldn't find a replacement right, for a day or two. Um, again, we talked about this, uh, more staff will likely resign or seek medical exemptions. Remember, people that went to the doctor and got checked out, under this hybrid schedule with the social distancing and all those other protective factors, the doctor said, okay. Some of them were on the line and they're here because of the hybrid schedule. If we switch the conditions on the ground so that things are more risky and there's a higher probability of um, contracting COVID, more teachers are gonna be eligible and seek those medical exemptions to not be here, right? And legitimately so. Things got more risky. What was acceptable under the hybrid is no longer given the conditions that some folks have going to be acceptable under full in person. So we have to be aware of that. And then again, those symptomatic absences, we are going into the cold and flu season. As people get the sniffles, as they get the coughs, as they get the body aches and the flu symptoms, um, they're going to be out. They're going to be out for longer periods of time because we have to make sure they don't have COVID before we let them back. So we're going to have a hard time, I believe, keeping enough staff um, to go full in person. Uh, operationally, um, RUHS spent an incredible amount of time this, this summer building a schedule to put those students into pods. They also did a couple of other things. They made sure that the students in their core courses got the same amount of time on learning in those core courses as, as they always had before COVID. How did they do it? More time on the core courses got rid of a lot of the electives. So there was the hit on the electives, but the focus on the core um, is the same as it's always been. That schedule will need to be rebuilt from scratch. Takes about a week to do. Also means that um, students may not have the teachers for the classes that they have now once that transition occurs. Again, operational considerations is all, all this is, but you know, it's, it, this is a fairly major one. Um, it means that the best time to make a changeover if we do it is at the end of a marking period, end of a semester, end of a quarter. The other piece is the budget. It's been climbing and matter of fact, we're up another hundred grand now. So 900,000 above and beyond the budget that we planned for um, has been spent so far as of right now. That is due to all the additional supplies and equipment and cleaning. Um, required to maintain a building um, that's operating during a pandemic. 
um, and it is extensive and it adds up every month. If we go to full in person, um, the needs for disinfectant and cleaning and everything else is gonna increase as well, which is fine, but just be aware that that will accelerate this cost. Now, um, the legislature did approve more money um, in terms of CRF funds uh, for us. Um, we still haven't seen a penny of it. We're already 900,000 in the hole. Most districts are about 1.1 million in the hole right now. So we're doing a little bit better than most districts. Um, but that's a lot of money if you think about that across the state. That's 70 million or so right now, 70.1 million, I believe it is, um, of a deficit that was unplanned for, is not in the current tax base to draw, draw from. And so if things don't come through, we got some pretty steep things we're gonna have to discuss in terms of the budget season. Um, we, Lane, do you have that $900,000 um, managed so we can see those actual expenses and what they are? Yep. yep. So, so what they, they, what they, they do is um, any expense that comes in, in we, we put, put it under a COVID line in the budget. And I'm happy to give that to you if you want it. Um, and the reason that we're tracking it separately is we need to do that so that hopefully as we put in the reimbursements that we have, we've got all that information in front of us. When they pull our state data, what we're applying for dang well better match what we put into our information that goes in in the state data draw. Um, that's one of the ways that they, they check up on us, make sure that we're, we're doing what we're supposed to. Um, and right now, um, this is actually interesting. A couple of the other superintendents said this at the last superintendent's meeting um, that we're in the hybrid sc schedule. Things are working right now from an educational standpoint. Um, those initial assessments that have been happening, right? Track my progress, star 360. Um, they show that the students right now in the hybrid mode are performing at or better than they have in previous years, this initial data. Well, why is that? Well, when the students come in, they're in smaller classes. They get more time with the teacher. The teacher can move through more material quicker while still providing them more one-on-one -on -one individual instruction. The other thing that's probably an even bigger factor is that we're not having any behavioral issues in this district right now. The students are coming in, I think because the relationships are closer, right? There's fewer kids in the classroom. The teachers are able to make better connections with them. Um, there's no behavioral issues getting in the way um, of learning. And it was interesting, um, two other superintendents at the last WVSA meeting I was at um, said the same thing about their hybrid schedules. They said, well, it's kind of interesting. Our assessments, our assessments are up and the behavior is down, um, which was good. So it seems to be something about the hybrid schedule. And no, I am not recommending it permanently. I want to see students back in person um, at some point in time. Um, but the current system is up and running efficiently and well. And it took a lot of planning. You know, we, we planned all summer. I got burned out staff because they worked their tails off all summer, um, getting things happening the, the, the way that it's happened. And we've only been in this mode for what, four weeks? Feels like forever, but it's only been four weeks, people. My recommendations to the board, because again, you guys reserved um, the decision to yourselves, which is perfectly fine. Um, first thing, if you intend at some point in time of going to full in-person instruction, first thing you need to do, reach out to the union and be begin negotiations around it. You I have two sons. I have a question because yeah. I looked at our MOU that we negotiated in August um, because I saw that you had mentioned something about negotiating revisions. I didn't see in that MOU. Do you, where, you have it up? Uh, I can get it. If you look at the very last provision on there, if there are other changes. This is definitely, you know, if, if I don't think we mentioned a hybrid modality in that or specified, we, we did talk about ending it, the MOU in June of 2021. Or, or earlier if they do away with the state of emergency. But the very last line in those MOUs, if I remember correctly, is if we will come back together if there are other changes. And I guarantee if we try to go to full in-person instruction, that is a pretty significant change. You can talk. Yeah. So see, I think it's the very last. And even if it's not, it's important to keep them in discussion.
The last says the party shall negotiate any additional impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic as they arise. That's right. Uh, and I would argue that, and they will argue. You mentioned a hybrid modality. We did allow Fridays for planning so that no student um, will be at school on Fridays. But I looked through and I did not see any, you know, sort of there would be hybrid modality language in it. Um, and, I, you know, I could have missed we, I through and I did not see that. So. We were we worked all summer with the staff for the hybrid modality. That's what they were expecting. Um, that's why that Friday piece is in there. So I'm not. I'm just taking. I did not see that specified in the MOU. So to me, I mean, my review did not show that we would have to renegotiate the MOU if we decide to change the way we operate the schools. Read, read that last sentence for me one more time. Any impact? Oh, let me find it. The party shall negotiate any additional impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic as they arise. Changing a learning modality is going to be a significant impact. did not specify, it, I think, in my view. I'm again, I'm just taking the I'm giving you my recommendation um, and my best recommendation based upon that wording um, is that the first step would be to begin calling them in having a conversation with them about adapting the MOU to full in person um, but I would I would talk with them about their feelings on it. Hopefully there are a few on. I think I saw Nora on there who might be able to talk about that as we get towards the end. Um, the second piece um, would be to send out uh, another survey. We started off the year with a survey about modalities that folks um, preferred. And it was about 80% that wanted either hybrid or and or um, remote. It was about 20% that wanted full in person at that time. That may have shifted. And I do want to caution folks in terms of this recommendation that just because it's a desire does not mean it's making things more safe or unsafe. It's just a desire. It tells us what people's appetite is. So it's not it's not for in with the protective factors or the, the risk factors. It's just this is what our appetite is for. So it is important information to have. If there is a plan to change the full in-person instruction, I'm going to recommend that is no sooner than the end of second quarter, right? At the halfway mark. Why? Well, we've got two or three schools that are going to full in person at the start of this winter season with all the things that we talked about um, going on. It would be nice to learn from hopefully their successes, but if not successes, their mistakes. Um, it'll also provide time for the, the massive change that's going to be required to the RUHS schedule. Um, allow us to kind of take advantage of the time while we got it, avoid a lot of the, the, the risky season where things are building across the country and potentially across the state uh, during the riskiest months of the year when people are inside. Um, yeah. And then the last piece of this is if we do go back, um, that we use a phased approach. Right? So not everybody comes back all together on the first day. We start off with the youngest kids first, maybe two or three grades, give it a week or so, see how it's going, learn learn what we can from bringing them back in, um, give people a chance to adapt to the new cleaning responsibilities and disinfectant responsibilities and other protocols we're going to have to put into place and then bring in another three or four grades and another three or four grades until we get them all back. Um, again, my recommendations, I if the board decides something different, you know, I will support it, do my best to try to make it work. Um, I do not see, even on the staffing side, especially without having a conversation with the union, which is appropriate, um, uh, that it, it will work. Um, but my recommendations. And this would be a good time for discussion. I have a question. All right. So first, let's start with discussion amongst the board. Um, so if you want to say something or ask Blaine some question, please unmute your microphone and, um, you know, say what you need to say. And then we'll open it up for public comment. I'll go first. Um, thank you, Lane, for your presentation. Um, my question would be, about uh, we're hearing a lot about 
what the union would like, um, how the approach to the school, all of the very thoughtful um, modifications that were made coming into the building for all of our students. Uh, what about the human toll on our kids? Um, what about the way that they're responding to this um, schedule that is actually, um, you know, it's disruptive. You know, one day is a play day, perhaps one day is at, in school. And in those minds that you're forming, my concern really, um, are we thinking about the kids in these discussions? So I think one thing that people can't forget is we are in the middle of a global pandemic, the likes of which the world has not seen for a hundred years. And what that means is that all of our lives are disrupted. What that means is that we are all suffering hardships that we do not want to suffer. I am in agreement with you. Is hybrid the best schedule um, for students? No. But that's not the real question. The real question is, is hybrid the best schedule for students in a global pandemic? Going into a time of the year that is the most riskiest for all involved, while rates of infection are going up across the country and even a little bit in our own state, is that the wisest choice? I don't want to sit down, even with one kid or one teacher at the end of this, and have to look them in the eye knowing that something happened that could have been prevented. This disease kills. This disease maims people for life. Yes, the risk is incredibly low. How do we mitigate that risk? We put in protective factors. If we switch to full in-person instruction in the worst time of the year to do it, we are increasing those probabilities that something bad will happen. Does it mean it has to? No, it's probability. And I, and I accept that. Um, but again, I don't wanna have to look, look at a family in those, those situations knowing that we could have done something better. Um, they are learning. Our assessments are showing that they're learning at or better than previous years. Not all students, the students that are participating in the hybrid schedule are, the students that are not performing very well right now are two. Um, they are our students that are in remote session, fully remote session, because that's what the parents wanted. That's the, the students that are struggling right now. And we also have a number of um, students that have high needs, many of which right now um, are actually coming to school more than just the hybrid schedule to try to serve those needs. Um, but these are students with some pretty intense, uh, intense high needs. So again, it's 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 a matter. Your question is a good one, um, but we cannot forget we are dealing with a situation the likes of which we haven't seen in our lifetimes. Um, so again, I don't have a I don't have an answer for you better than that. I worry about the probability piece. That's what I look like look at. I'm not fearful about it. Um, I'm a scientist, I'm a physicist, I'm a geologist. Um, I'm also a bit of a mathematician. I just look at the probabilities. It's a good question, I appreciate it. Other. You mentioned at the beginning that um, unless there was a major uh, event or change to how this is going, you didn't really, it didn't sound like you saw a way to kind of bring back to another point with modalities, I'm just curious if you feel that the major issue that we're waiting for is a vaccine. Is that what you're seeing as like, once that comes out, that would be a way to you know, lower risk? No, um, historical data is good too. If we make it through these tough months from September to February, things are good, we're able to manage the situation, we don't have an outbreak. And we know that from February on, the probability of infection is decreasing. And we know that spring is right around the corner and we can get the kids back outside. That would be the perfect time to go to full in person. So for me, if it were completely my call, I didn't have to consider anything else except the probabilities, my argument would be end of, end of third quarter. 
um, April. Bring them back for one quarter. Get things again. We don't know how long this is going to go on. We've all got. I and push back on me if I'm wrong. I think, including me, I think we've all got it in our head that you know by the end of the school year everything is back to normal. There are people out there saying four to five years now. Um, we may be living with this in some shape or form or fashion for quite a while. Um, if we get students back full in person at the end of third quarter, get some real practice during a safer time of the year with all the additional protocols and safety pieces that we've got to do, um, get everybody practiced on it, then we'll be good to go that next fall full in person. Um, hopefully there's a vaccine at that time, which brings, you know, another protective factor, brings risk down, doesn't eliminate it, but brings risk down. Um, you know, we'll be in, in, in a much better place. Again, my opinion, it's just an opinion. But good question. Um, I, I just have a couple of comments. Um, as we go into this giant discussion, you know, and I've been reading the, some of the Facebook stuff. I've been overhearing conversations at soccer, I don't know, the grocery store. Um, and, and my comment is this, we have to be really careful with how we're speaking about this and how we're um, sometimes speaking for um, a group of people that we are not a member of. Um, I mean that to say, well, I hear a lot of teachers feel this, or Oops, sorry about that. Do you have your mic on? I do have my mic on. Um, this is what the, the union most likely will say about that. I think um, we have to be really careful and, and um, deliberate in getting information from the people we need the information from and not speaking for them. Um, I think we have to be careful about language. Teachers who are working remotely are working. They did not um, request or choose not to work. That, that wasn't the option. And if they did choose not to work, it, uh, I can't speak for them. I don't know why they would have done that, but, the, but they, given the option to work remotely, was not them choosing not to go back to work. That's a big one for me. And I think it's really easy to kind of quickly say it in that manner, but I, I'm recommending and I'm, I'm holding myself to this too, to slow down and be careful with my language and how I'm speaking um, about that. Uh, the, the, the one, the last comment I, I want to make is um, I'm, a, I'm a parent, I'm a working parent. Um, I work full time and I've got a kid in, in hybrid. I also have a preschooler. Um, but as a board member, when I come here as a board member, I'm trying to remind myself that I can't come here and only be thinking about my kids or only be thinking about how hard it is for me right now to be on a Zoom meeting where I'm talking budget and then help my kids spell a word. It, it, it is hard and that's always present for me. I can't put it aside, but as a school member, I'm, I have to think about the entire community. I can't just think about my bubble. I can't just think about my own family. I can't just think about my one, the, the, the one school that my kid does go to. It's my responsibility to think about the entire community and what is healthy and safest for the entire community. Those are my comments. Any other comments from the board? I just actually have one, one quick one. Um, from what I'm hearing too, the, the idea of potentially approaching reopening with the elementary schools would be a recommendation. It sounds like the elementary schools would be better equipped to deal with the influx of students coming in rather than potentially the high school, middle school at this time. I would, uh, again, when I'm making the recommendation about the phase, that's, you know, second semester. Uh, one of the things to remember about our district um, is the el elementary schools, not every classroom, um, but mm -hmm. especially if you go to RES in some of the classrooms in both Braintree and, and Brookfield, they got 20 kids per class, right? So bringing them back, 
Um, they're going to be more overcrowded than, than many of the classrooms at the high school, not all. Um, but yes, there, there is, there is going to be an overcrowding problem in some classrooms if they come back. That's why, again, I, again, I'm just, I'm looking at probabilities and that's why, at least for me, um, it's, hey, you know, let's get through this, 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 this time of increased risk first. And then once that, that increased probability goes away, lowers down, we can re replace it with something else, which is bringing the kids back full in time. You know, it's always about trying to balance risk and risk and protection um, to me. I, I guess know. I would be interested to repeat that public survey, especially for K-6 uh, families, because you said 80% prefer the hybrid or fully remote. So maybe we only have a handful of families that would say, yes, we definitely want our kids, our elementary kids to go full in person. Um, and maybe it would not be enough to stress our current system. Um, you know, if, if truly there are many families that, that are happy um, with the current modality, you know, perhaps it would just be interesting to know how many kids would be coming back to, to that four day a week scenario. Are you looking question on elementary or just in general or, or split them out? I guess I was, you know, I think it probably makes is more important for K-6 uh, students and the families that have K-6 students, um, all those parents are probably more burdened than the ones with kids in, in middle school or high school as far as trying to balance this work uh, home life situation. So I personally would be interested to know, you know, whether it would be possible um, to bring more kids back in, um, in the K-6. Yeah, that's easy. I, I wanted to wait to talk here to get some of that information that you're giving me right now. Um, I was going to put the survey out actually last week. I said, no, let me talk with the board because there may, there may be other information that's important to them. That So that's a good one. So I can do that next week, easy enough. Yep. Other, um, oh, go ahead. I'll kind of second what uh, Laura said about asking that, but I can stay from, from my experiences when we had that survey come around, there was only two options to choose from. We had remote or hybrid. There wasn't a full school option. So that's when you were saying that most people chose hybrid or remote. That's the only choices they had. Because I mean, I know I would have chosen full in school at that time. I chose hybrid because those were the only two options we had. So I think we definitely need to ask the people what they really prefer. And um, I am not opposed to your idea of waiting to kind of see what other people are doing, but also maybe we should start planning before that time. And then even if we as a board could get something from you at some time, you know, in the next two, three months, of of a plan of how it would work to transition to a full in school. Well, that that that's a, you're hitting exactly, exactly on the that. recommendation. That's the recommendation. It, for for me, that would begin with talking with the union about that MOU. What do we need? If we go to full in person, what are things that we need to tweak about this to potentially make this happen? Um, because if we don't have staff buy on, if we don't buy in, if we don't have staff that are able or willing you know, the, it's, it's going to be a moot point right off the bat. And I think the survey is incredibly important too, at this point in time, again, it's not telling us anything scientific about safety, just do people have the appetite. Um, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm with you hundred percent on that, on that piece. I think you can tell us yeah. what well, the appetite for the balance of risk and, uh, and uh, um, chance yeah. of coming yeah. back. Yeah. So. We might find in a month, everything is fine. I doubt it the probability to, but it's possible um and again this is remember these recommendations are me sitting here right now looking ahead to a future i can't predict um in a month from now that recommendation might change um, but right now you know looking at, at what's out there in the data looking at what's out there what folks are talking about checking the cdc that's the concerns um and so you know future is foggy right now 
Um, so this is the best best recommendation I can give you under the circumstances. Um, and it may not be right. Okay, I'm gonna open up this discussion to um, any questions from the public or comments or points of view or whatever you would like to say. Um, every person has, well, we've got a lot of people on here, so I'd like to limit comments or questions to three minutes a piece, if we can. Thanks. And you're please gonna, your name. You're gonna need to turn I your- I have a question. So somebody has speakers on, if you're facilitating. I have a question if no one else is need, needing to speak first. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for your presentation, um, Lane. And, and I, uh, my um, comments have, um, are gonna resonate a lot with what Laura and Ashley and, and Brian said. Um, you know, as a, as a pediatrician in town, I'm not trying to speak for every family, certainly, but I do speak for a lot of them when I say that a lot of parents are at their breaking point right now. And Ashley mentioned the human toll. You talk about probability, um, but there is a human cost to this right now um, that at the moment is exceeding COVID risks. Uh, and um, we do, it, it is important to understand that we live in Vermont. Our state is much different from a lot of the hot spots nationwide. Um, and I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, the kids, I'm, I'm happy to hear about the statistics that, you know, seem to indicate that the kids are learning well, but I'm concerned that a lot of them are very unhappy. Um, maybe that has a lot to do with the home life they're experiencing, because I think, again, parents are, many of them are at their breaking point and, and can't take much more of this. Uh, economically, I think a lot of parents are at their breaking point and they don't know which way to turn. Uh, and I think it's really important to consider that in any kind of reopening plan. Um, the, the third thing um, I'm concerned about is that I'm watching other schools open fully. Some of them are going to be opening or some of them are already open and some of them are opening October 26th. And my concern is that we're going to have, you know, families watching that and un not being able to maintain their jobs in Randolph anymore if their kids are not in a full learning modality and that they're going to leave and seek to enroll them in other schools that are open. They take a risk that those schools then close if they have an outbreak, certainly, but if they don't for a few months, that parent has now gotten an income back, you know, that otherwise wouldn't. And so I really love Laura's ideas about reissuing the survey. When I took the survey, you know, my children are in preschool and second grade. I was, I wrote in, I need full-time learning because of my job and, um, my husband's job, honestly, too. We've been making it work, but barely. And, and we have more resources, honestly, than some families do. But we weren't given that choice. And I think that um, what the community wants or needs is not accurately refre reflected from that earlier survey. And I would be very interested to have that survey issued again, because if there are only a few handful of students that want to go full time and those kids can go full time, it would help out, you know, a lot. Um, but um, we are not the rest of the country. We're Vermont, and it's not that we're immune to this, but realistically, COVID isn't going anywhere. It's not going to disappear. There's highly unlikely that we're going to get a vaccine for children anytime soon because their adult trials are far uh, before the children trials. And so uh, I don't know what our endpoint is here, but um, you, you know that. I, I, you know, I just can't see this going on much longer. Um, but if there are a few families whose kids want to go full time, and that's actually not a high number, it would it would help a lot of families. Flu didn't go away after the pandemic. We're still dealing with this, right? And and nobody cared about the risk of flu deaths prior to this. Now, granted, coronavirus is so much higher um, than flu, but it didn't go away. And so we're going to have to learn to live with this at some point. There's never going to be zero risk anymore, ever. So, you know, my, my other question speaks to hiring of more staff. Do you have a plan for that? Okay, those are the end of my comments. Thank you for listening to me. Yeah, I can, uh, I can go through the, the questions that you have and, and good ones as well. And a lot of, lot of thought, and I appreciate that an awful lot awful lot. I'm just writing down the hiring one so that I don't forget that hiring. So in terms of um, 
opening the other schools, I can speak a little bit to that because I have met with, like I said, I, I meet with the Winooski Valley Superintendents Association frequently. Um, so the other superintendents, we talk about what they're planning, what things they're encountering. Um, there were two that were talking about going to full in person, but they both said exactly the same thing. Um, and it was the primary thing that guided their decision. And it had to do with the six foot distancing. Um, they were in districts whose enrollments had gone down over the years, like has happened in much of Vermont, in bigger schools, and they felt that they were able to bring their full student body back, um, or as much of it as possible, um, and still maintain that full six feet of student distancing because of it. We're not in that boat. Our enrollments, as you saw with the numbers, you know, for three years were going up. Um, so we do have classes um, that are going to be um, a bit crowded. So it's a, it's a little bit different in terms of the comparison there. We, we did make a very strong commitment um, to trying to maintain that six foot distancing until the guidance changed. Um, the guidance has changed a little bit for, I believe it's K to six, right? They're saying three to six foot distancing. You know, they still prefer the six if you can do it, but three, three to six foot distancing is okay. It's still six foot distancing at the high school level. Um, currently right now. But their decisions were based upon the fact that they had space and they could continue to maintain that, that six foot distancing piece. And I, I'm in agreement with you, it is a hardship. It's a hardship on everyone. Um, and I do have to stop for a little while and make sure that people remember, you know, what the schools have done, you know, over the last six or seven months. Um, we feed everybody in these three communities that need to. We stepped up to the plate when very few other districts could do it this past summer um, to make sure that essential workers got childcare that they needed um, at the beginning of this, this pandemic. We provide mental health services to students. We provide medical services to students. We have counselors that go out and meet in the homes. Um, we are doing and working um, maximally for folks. And I don't want folks to kind of forget that um, because we have our own hardships as well. And I think we all have to expect the fact that things aren't gonna be great for a while until something, something uh, major changes. Our hope is we wanna go back full in person eventually when it's safe and appropriate to do so. And the difficult part is trying to figure out when, that, when, it's, safe, um, when it's safe to do. Um, I'm in agreement on the survey piece. Um, I mean, that's that's why, you know, it's part of the recommendation. It does need to go out. I had forgotten about that. So I'm glad that Brian and that you brought, brought that up when we did the original surveys. Um, at the time, and again, guidance changes. Um, at the time, we were going into school in step two. And so at that time, they hadn't separated uh, step two from learning modality. So we were all assuming it was going to be hybrid. That's what step two meant at the time. And then later, remember just before the school year opened, September 8th came, um, the governor came out and said, oh, we're gonna control the, the, the steps, the phases, you know, one, two, three, but the school board now it's in your hands to decide what happens locally in terms of mo learning modality. That's why the survey was that way up front. So you're right, and I, I had forgotten that. So I'm glad that you reminded me. In terms of hiring plan, we need people. People are not applying for positions. We have a plan in place. We hire what we need. I've even gone to the board and the board was fantastic in terms of uh, the custodial, additional custodial staff that we needed. They gave us um, the funding from the reserve funds to be able to supply those. We have what we need, except we don't have people available to fill those positions. Um, they're, you know, in the best of times in Vermont, they're fairly scarce. Um, but now with the added risk and anxiety, you just can't get them. Um, and it's worse, obviously, in some, some categories, depending upon what we're looking for as opposed to others. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a matter of supply and demand. Um, the supply just is not there um, at this point in time. Um, we can afford it, um, but we just, we don't have the, excuse me, we don't have the bodies. So I, I appreciate the, the, the questions um, and thoughtful ones and, and intu intuitive uh, and informative. <clears throat> would anyone else whoops would anyone else like to make a comment or ask a question nora i oh. oh thanks thanks so much well well first of all i i would like to just thank lane because i think he has really um articulated well the the needs and the risks and and um the the thoughtfulness behind all the decision making 
that that's happening. Um, I, I do want to put out that um, I'm going to speak tonight for, for myself more than for the union, because um, I agree. I don't think that we should be, um, I, I don't feel comfortable speaking for others um, without first discussing it with, with those others. And we have not had a chance to, to do that. Um, I, I do want to say though that, um, and, and maybe this is in my role as, as a union leader, that um, I, I think I can be fairly safe in, in saying that that all teachers um, are feeling that they want what's best for students as well as, as looking out for their own safety. That um, there is not a teacher working um, now who is not going um, the extra mile or the extra distance um, to, to make sure that um, students' needs are, are being met to the best of their abilities. Um, but at that, to that end, um, I, I would also say that, that we, we do want, of course, to have students back full time um, in schools. There, there isn't a teacher who does not want that. Um, but to do it in a way, as Lane has said so so well, in a way that is safe um, and and with the least amount of risk possible for for everyone involved, and that includes the the students as well. Um, it is not possible to maintain um, that six foot um, physical distancing in, as he has said, in many of the classrooms um, throughout the district. If we were to have everybody come back right now, and and he has given. I think um, I don't need to, to repeat all of his reasons why that's so important to do right now. Um, so I, I, I did want to make a comment about the, the MOU. Um, it would be definitely a huge change. Um, not that at the MOU is not going to be something that stands in the way of switching back to full, being fully in person, but it is something that we would need to discuss and to work out and, and to have those discussions be open and ongoing um, between the board and the association. So, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes, hi, Lindsay Hopp here. Um, just a couple of um, sort of sort of fast things. I'm glad that Lane kind of brought back out that for the younger students right now, the recommendation is the three to six feet. And I think that especially in those classrooms where we might be looking at the overcrowding, if we consider three to four feet, the use of, you know, music rooms, libraries, gyms, you know, um, IEP rooms and things like that, I think we could definitely consider trying to get creative. And I, I really think that um, you know, the idea of a phase makes sense. And I think the elementary kids make sense, especially when we talk about the well-being of children, um, the child care issues. I think it definitely affects them more. So even if there's overflow for some kids to be in the high school. Um, so I think that's one thing that we just want to continue to keep in mind is what the true recommendations are for each age group and really try and go to them. But if we go to the six foot max every time, that may mean we can't. And if we go to three to four, maybe that brings us back. Um, I think the other thing that would be helpful to think about is not just school spread, but community spread. So as a two family working home, I am piecemealing my children throughout the community three days a week. I have no choice. I work in healthcare. I have to treat my patients. I have to be there. My husband is a builder. He has to build homes. We can't stay home. So it means our most vulnerable people for a lot of us are watching our kids. It's our grandparents, our great aunts and uncles, our friends from other districts. I own a business in town that's currently holding hybrid camps, which is great, but it means you're bringing kids from Braintree, Brookfield, and Randolph together. We wear masks. We clean everything just as much as the schools are, but if we're able to do that, wouldn't the cohort make more sense to be the young kids that are less vulnerable than making all of those individuals exposed to everybody else throughout the community? daycare providers, babysitters, I mean, all of those people are taking that in. So it's not really like every parent just staying home with their kids. We're really exposing our community and the more vulnerable members of our community more by being in this hybrid model for those working parents. And I really think what Christina Nicola and the medical professionals um, are putting out there is really the fact more than some of the numbers that are being driven by. I mean, the state didn't decide to go to phase three without looking at all the same probabilities, but they looked at Vermont's probabilities. You know, these other school districts are not all ignoring these probabilities when they're making these things happen. And so I think we really owe it to our, our families and our teachers to make 
a smart move, but really start talking about it. I think trying to say to families, wait until February or March while everybody else may have a successful nine months and we may miss that boat is just is overwhelming. And so I think we really need to focus on the next steps and kind of realize we can't stay stuck here. And maybe the next step isn't full in person, but that's where the surveys and stuff will help. But there needs to be, I think, some forward movement at this point towards some change because we're in a good place. So that's my two cents. And I thank you all for listening. Thanks very much, Lindsay. Uh, anyone else have a question or comment for the board and for uh, the superintendent? Um, I have a comment. This is Tev Kalman. Um, yeah, just, just a couple of things I want to add on. I also want to really thank and, and, uh, appreciate just the way that Lane laid out sort of both the, the risks and the, the assets that we have as a, um, as a school community. So, and yeah, like, no, I'm not speaking for anybody but myself, but, but I think that, um, I'm very much behind what you're saying, but I also want to speak to, you know, as also a working parent, I, you know, I guess one point I just want to make is, um, I think it's important to remember that many of us who are employees of, of you, the board of, of the district and of the town, we're in the same boat as you. Right, we're we're trying to work and we're trying to raise kids and deal with um, what Ms. Hapt I think was speaking to. It's just like a, a society that has has so many institutions are like run running on fumes, and and we're now running up against that. And so, um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have very much to offer other than like a lot of compassion um, for the situation that y'all are in. Um, and a hope that we can find a way to like talk about what are some of the things that we need. Obviously, this is not a board conversation, but um, a conversation I think we really need to have. It's like we have a lot of common interests as um, teachers and custodians and food service workers at this school and as parents. And a lot of us are the same people. And so um, I think that a lot of the, the decisions we're being forced to make by you know, not just the lack of a vaccine, but the lack of um, of the ability for families really to make choices um, to to do what's safe across the board. I, I think is something that that's a conversation that we need to have. Um, and then the the kind of more concretely to the um, to, to the MOU, I think there's. No, as Nora was saying, there's no desire to like use the MOU as a sticking point um, to, you know, to prevent going to the next phase. I think there's anecdotally, I know there's there's many of our members who want to go to the, that next phase, as well as many of our members who are terrified, um, you know, for, for legitimate reasons of going to that next phase. So um i think i hear a lot of people talking about wanting to have the conversation and i think that's something that the union is very much open to um and i think i'm also hearing a lot about how it's it's kind of a different conversation at different you know in different buildings at different levels um the concerns of the high school are not the same as rtcc or the elementary schools so i yeah, I guess I just want to like say that that we're we're open to having those conversations. Um, one last piece is just just to call attention to, and I think Lane, you spoke to this a little bit, you know, in terms of like the time it would take to rearrange the schedule, but also um, thinking about the friction that's created by a schedule change or changing teachers in mid year, which is something we've already done a lot of, um, and and it's. Um, just something to factor in when we're thinking about making these decisions. So I, I think um, starting to have the conversation is a good idea, um, but I think it's a really complex one. And, and to Dr. Dina Cole's question, MOU is a memorandum of understanding, a side agreement to the contract. Thank you. Laura, I have a um, Thank comment you. or a question. Yep. Um, anyone else? 
Laura, I have a question. Um, so Amy Ferris, again, a, an elementary teacher, a two parent working home with two teenagers. Um, and I would echo many of the thoughts that I've heard tonight, but I think one of the thoughts that we really need to factor in for both the kids and the teachers is the lack of staffing and substitutes. Um, I know for both of my teenagers, they've had staff and I, and we've had it in the elementary school too, who had to be out. And as we start to see more kids starting to sniffle and have earaches and things like that, um, the lack of substitutes right now is going to present an issue for both the kids and the teachers because they're not going to have a body or someone else may not have a body because somebody has got to cover and they've got to sort of prioritize who gets coverage and who doesn't. So I just, I think that's an important issue to look at moving forward. Thanks, Amy. Anyone else? Who's next? Could I jump in here? Um, a, a, a comment and a question. I just want to underscore what Ted was talking about in terms of how complex it will be to switch modalities. So I wonder if, Lane, you could give any idea. I mean, I'm aware of to get to the modality we're at, even just traffic patterns in, in drop-offs. I mean, the amount of work that went into it, it I can't even list all the things. I mean, it, it's it's overwhelming to think of it. And it actually reminds me of when I, you know, have a, a question for my daughter's teacher on a day that she's remote. And that teacher can't get back to me right away because that teacher is teaching the other class. And I think it's it's hard for me to remember that just because my daughter's remote, the, the, the teacher's still in the classroom teaching. Um, so it, to to switch to a new modality, very complex, a lot of work while the other work is still continuing. So how long do you think, we've been at this, you said for four weeks, I can't believe that. I mean, it's that's mind blowing. It has only been four weeks. Um, is it realistic if we wanted to shoot for the second semester or you know the third quarter coming back to in person? The 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 workload, the complexities is, is that doable? Realistic? So it's a it's a good question. Um, it literally and again, first first step is talk talk with the union. Um, cause there's going to be some good ideas about the best way to make it work there. It would be pulling the teams back together to start to discuss it, including our COVID coordinators who have the connections with the department of health in terms of what it would look like for protocols and procedure. Um, but there are two things right off the, the gut sitting here right now that I think are going to be impacted. The first is that we still have a tremendous amount of professional development planned for this year. Um, for in-service days, for, for half days and things like that, um, especially the second half of the year, designed to getting us towards those performance ends. All set up, all planned, you know, prior to the start of this year, those would have to go away to provide time to do this planning. And or we may have to take a few days off with no, no kids here to get the staff together um, to be able to sit down, do the brainstorming and do the work about really getting down to the nitty gritty of the logistics. I'm rearranging the Yeah, I'm, I'm really good in leading the general. This is kind of what you gotta do, fill in the details, but they need to fill in the details because they're closest to the work. They know what it means. They, they, they know how to apply it. And that's gonna take some time. Um, we are in a bit of a bind in terms of time this year. Um, the state has already approved that the school year is only 170 days. Um, that, that came out of the last legislative session that ended last week. Um, and so anything above and beyond that that we take to do this work is going to require um, either extra days added onto the calendar now um, for the kids, which we can't do because, you know, we'd have to pay the staff to both do the work here on the days they're here doing the planning and then the extra days for the kids or getting a waiver from the state. And I don't know how willing they're going to be to provide a waiver if they've already cut us from, you know, 177 required days down to 170. But the teachers do have for doing and other work. Half, half a day. Friday, 
which we've made available. So that seems like that could be used for this sort of, you know. Half a day, half a day for their teaching planning. Um, the other half of the day is actually so that so that we don't lose a learning day. Um, they have created and have set up um, asynchronous work for the other half. Um, so it would be adding a, another whole set of duties on them on that day. I mean, again, the easiest way to do it is to go to, to, to professional development days and try to rearrange what we'd already planned. But um, again, it's, it's po anything's possible. It's, it's not easy. It would probably take until the, if we started working on it now and, and the path were clear, and we knew nothing was going to change between now and then, it would probably take until second semester to really do it right. But go ahead. I just want to, I just want to point out something in the chat. Um, and you may have just addressed it with your discussion about Fridays, but she said if we were to move to four, day, four days in person, is that considered still hybrid? And would the MOU need to be addressed at that point? So if we can address it. Uh, from my perspective, um, and again, folks can push back on I me. Mean, you, you may have different ideas. As long as COVID is there and we're still in a state of, emergen state of emergency, um, if full in-person means four days, it still means they get that Friday um, to me. Um, again, doesn't mean that can't be changed or that's, that's my impression off, off the cuff um, because we need the time in those cases, especially since we have more kids in the school, more interactions, we need the time to air the place out over the three days and do a real deep cleaning, um, right? We're doubling the population, doubling exposure risks, if not more. Um, we're gonna need that time to do that work. So good questions. The MOU can be a public document, yes it can. Going to use the Friday to go yeah, uh, it's a good point right now that Amy is is bringing up is we are trying to balance out time in the buildings. We have two basic functions that are going on. One is the teaching and the learning and being open for the, the, the teachers to do their planning where they have their resources. The second is it takes a significant amount of time to do the disinfecting and the cleaning that must happen every day. And so we spent a, a good week at the beginning of the year kind of working out these agreements between uh, the facility staff and the instructional staff and the principals about, okay, how much time do you need to make things work on the instructional side? Is that reasonable giving the cleaning task and the time it's gonna to take to do the cleaning that happens? And right now things are in a very good balance and it would be very difficult to disrupt that. Um, you know, if they get more time in their classrooms, we don't have enough time to potentially clean um, every room the way that it needs to be, which means we would have rooms that would be closed. That affects social distancing and we would have problems. We have the agreement that if we don't get things clean the way they need to be, um, that we will shut down those rooms and not use them until the cleaning occurs. So right now, everything's in a nice balance between those two, two functions. So Amy, good point. More time for public comment. So feel free to um, ask a question or make a comment. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Better, yeah. Okay, sorry. I had to dial uh, on my phone. Um, so I want to go back to addressing um, Lane's presentation about protective factors and risk factors and the idea of going back to in-person training or in-person learning as this game of Russian roulette and just as a parent and I and I have hardships with this with three children in elementary school it's it's a game of Russian roulette that I'm ready to play um, and I'm having a really hard time wrapping my head around how we can just living this that we're saying that the assessments that, that, that the children are actually doing better because I just I'm personally not experiencing that and I have yet to meet a parent that is saying that so I guess I'd like to learn more about that is that at all levels is I mean are, are all the kids doing better oh, I'm sorry I'm not echoing here so the um, the initial data coming from our, our K to 12 directors as they're working um, 
on those initial assessments is coming back, it's, it's very positive. And they stated the same two um, reasons that the other superintendents did. And that was, um, you know, it's more intensive one-to-one -one time with the kids because the classes are smaller and fewer behavioral issues. There are groups that are suffering, um, some of the high need students, which is why we do have some of them back um, to close to four, four days per week now. Um, and also the students that are in for remote learning. Now, again, we're looking at a conglomeration of data. Does that mean that's true for every kid? No. Um, I've got two kids at home. Um, one of, actually both of them went through the remote session last year. One of them thrived in it. The other, it took Patty and I, it took my wife and I every ounce of strength that we had to keep him going. So I do know where people are coming from on this. Um, it's um, it's not, again, it's not the best modality um, for normal operations, but right now, you know, it was chosen because it seems to be the best modality for the situation we find ourselves in with COVID. Um, but hopefully I didn't get too far afield to your question. But no, I do, I, I understand where you're coming from and you are correct. You know, when we're looking at the data, it's in conglomerate, it is not um, true for every kid. Hi, Bethany Silloway here. Um, I just want to speak, you mentioned that the behaviors of the kids were better in school, which I guess I'm happy to hear, but I have to say on the at home level, um, I'm watching my five and a half year old daughter just spiral downward. She went from having consistent five day a week daycare at Robin's Nest um, all the way up until the start of kindergarten. And now she has absolute zero consistency uh, due to my husband and I both um, working full time, being bounced around from wherever, whoever and whomever we can find to take care of them <laughs> um, while we're at work and trying to get educated. She's getting kicked off of Google Meets um, because she can't sit there and be quiet through them. Um, and I guess I just can't really blame her for that. But I've been sitting here racking my brain like, why is her behavior getting so much worse? And I just can't help but feel like that's not coming from the lack of consistency um, that she is not, you know, she's just getting no consistency and school offers that. Um, and in reflection, I'm so thankful for that. Um, and I also am watching kids who typically thrive um, in school just really spiral um, with this current situation. And I just have to believe that, um, ha you know, some of that is coming from all of us parents just circling the drain <laughs> right now with stress and um, struggles and just everything that we're dealing with. And I know that everybody's got struggles and we're in a pandemic, but um, something has to be done before February, hearing February and April, just, I, I wanna vomit <laughs> um, because I don't know that my family can survive. We're fortunate. Um, we have a tutor right now for our kids on two of our remote days, which, we would not be where we are right now without that, but I can't sustain that until April. Um, it's not cheap <laughs> to have a tutor. And I, you know, I count myself fortunate that we can do that right now, but I know many families can't. And um, so I just wanna echo a lot of the concerns I've already heard tonight. Some of you took the words right out of my mouth. So thank you. She said them far better than I could, um, but yeah, just I'm, let's get these young kids back. Um, I appreciate that the high school uh, they have a lot of struggles and I think that it's easier for those kids to be doing this hybrid model, but for us parents with young kids, the childcare portion is just, it's killing us. So thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, next. Hi, my name is Megan O'Toole. I'm a parent of an elementary school student in Braintree. And I just wanted to um, say, you know, thank you to everybody for all the, the thought and um, the work that has gone into develop and developing and implementing the current plan of hybrid learning that, that we're currently under. Um, but uh, I thought that, um, you know, Hannah's question and point about the, the planning and the work that is going to need to go into um, switching uh, modalities to either a four day or full um, in-person five day plan. Um, 
is going to be a, a massive undertaking. And I would support that work starting now, um, even though a date for returning to a change in modality hasn't been set yet. I think it's, it's vital that that work begin now because I certainly recognize that it will be a huge undertaking. And so I think that, you know, the, I don't think the first decision should be when, I think it should be how, and then, um, you know, determining when that should happen. And, um, you know, I, I am not um, trained in, um, in uh, the field of education. Uh, I, I do not have any advanced degrees in early childhood development, but um, I have close friends and colleagues that, that do, and speaking with them, you know, their thoughts are that, it is vitally important that the younger children return to in-person learning as soon as possible and that their ability to you know, engage in the online learning and use the computers at home is much more limited and should be much more limited at their stage than the older middle school and high school age students. And so I am supportive of phasing in um, you know, more in-person days for younger children first. Um, and then I think I just also wanted to make a comment, and I think some people have kind of touched on this regarding the data that we're seeing with how students are, are reacting and responding to the hybrid learning mode. Um, I, I guess I, I don't think it's fair to really highlight that data or that information at this point in time, given that we, we have um, so little time actually participating in this, this form of learning and this modality. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that we don't know what's going to happen with, you know, with COVID and how that's going to continue to impact our community, and that's a real wild card. Um, but I, I, at the same time, I don't think it's fair to um, really hang your hat on or draw significant conclusions from, um, you know, the information regarding how students are doing under this modality. Um, so again, thank you very much, everyone, for your hard work. It's certainly recognized and greatly appreciated, and I appreciate being able to make a comment. Thanks, Megan. Um, who's next? Uh, we have plenty of time for more public comment or questions. In, in terms of um, teacher recruitment from a hiring standpoint, um, have you, I mean, it, it's hard for me to imagine that somebody somewhere who's living a hellish kind of existence right now in a hot spot wouldn't want to live in our community right now. <laughs> so have you put ads out in the Wall Street Journal? Have you? Um, have you have you exhausted all avenues for recruitment and have you exhausted avenues for recruitment while we're recruiting for diverse teachers as well? So the, oops, sorry about that, a couple of folks. So the primary mode is usually school spring, which is a national um, job posting board for education. It's where educators go. It's where they expect um, to look. So all of our stuff is posted on school spring. When we have um, difficulty, we do go to um, papers that are far in a field um, to try to get some, some hiring out. It has not been effective at all. Um, the reality is too, that we have to consider is that you know, if I've got people that are resigning, that's one thing. The position's open, I can replace it. If I have people that are just unable to work um, who still have a right to the position, that's a whole different ballgame um, because that gets into a significant budgetary impact. Um, but yes, no, we've, we've been doing the, the, the um, recruiting um, as best we can, but if there are ideas out there above and beyond, um, I am happy um, to take any ideas that folks have. <clears throat> Are there other questions or comments? Um, sorry. 
couple questions from the chat um, from Dr. Di Nicola. Have you consulted with other schools who are fully open on how they are managing these issues, such as staffing and cleaning? How are they able to do it? So the, the question in consulting with the other schools, um, yes, we have. Um, in some cases, the schools are bigger than us and they just yank people off the things that they should be doing and put them in, in, in other places. Um, and a lot of them, the principals are actually going in and teaching and serving as substitutes because we all have a substitute shortage. Um, so there has been some discussion about that. Um, we are not a, a administration heavy district. Um, so that would be difficult to do, but that is one of the emergency backup plans. The other emergency backup plan that we've got in place right now is if I have too many uh, teachers out in a building, um, especially like the smaller elementaries, we move to remote learning for the day um, because that can always happen. You know, it's not preferential. It's not the best choice, uh, but we cover what we can with the resources that we have, including the paraprofessionals. Um, and then if things get really bad, if we have a lot of people out, then, you know, we are potentially looking at going into remote learning for those days. Um, again, it's just not safe to have a, a, a large um, conglomeration of students here and not enough adults uh, to supervise and to manage, especially given um, the constraints of COVID. Some good questions. This may sound like a ridiculous idea, but there's a lot of unemployed parents right now. Um, I don't know what the criteria are to be a substitute teacher, but have we looked into our own population and our own community as a potential source of, you know, responsible, caring, willing individuals? Yeah, the 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 principals reach out to um, reach out to recent re recently retired as well as. Um, folks that have been retired a little bit longer. They're just, it's not the Im, Im, strong impression that I have. There just is not the appetite to work in a school around lots of folks um, for one of these positions, right? Cause you're, you're kind of going against, in a sense, you're going against the CDC guidelines, right? You're, you're coming together, you're congregating together, you're gathering together and that makes folks nervous. I think that's the real reason why it's been so difficult. It's also been in every um, newsletter uh, that that's come home. So it's also going out to all parents, not just the and and the um, retired folk as well. I've seen it. No, we've we've twisted some arms too. With with not too too much luck. So I want to um, thank all of these parents and folks for joining us tonight. I think it's brought up a lot of really good points. And I always think it's important to um, remind everybody what I have heard to make sure that we are on the same page with Lane moving forward. Um, so Lane, it appears to me there's the commitment to do um, the survey beginning with our elementary kids K through six to look at a increase presence in the building that could potentially be prior to the second semester if the um, spacing works. Uh, we said that we would make the MOU public to, uh, per Dr. Di Nicola's request, um, that the high school, because it sounds like the master schedule at the Randolph Union High School is of concern with the amount of time it would take to reestablish that 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 is a um, project that could begin working now. So if we are able to go to full in-person, that work is completed and not delaying that. And that we are going to continue to base the choices on um, scientific data and not so much fear, um, keeping in mind that our words matter on how we talk about this. Um, amongst, I think that, of course, Heidi has had some great, um, Hannah, sorry, <laughs> has had some great that. points <laughs> um, about, you know, making sure that, that how we talk about this is not based on our personal bias and our personal fears, but on science. And the fact that um, we thankfully have a hospital local to us that we could be asking for feedback there as well. 
So I think it's important to acknowledge what we've been asked to do and to confirm right now that we are making those steps. That was the recommendations that were made directly to the board and staff. Okay. Sorry about that. No, the the re those were actually the recommendations I made to the board in the presentation. So that's was the plan. Again, a lot of it is making sure that they're informed in in their duty as they are the decision making body for the change in modality, and making sure you know I'm giving them my recommendations. They can take take them if they want. They do not have to follow through on them. But it sounds like like for the most part that they do, with the one exception of a, a stronger focus on the K to six. Um, but no, it makes sense. And one of the reasons I'm making the recommendations now is because we recognize that there is a lot of planning that would need to take place for this to occur. Um, so all good points. And I appreciate folks' um, conversations tonight. I appreciate the talk. Um, I do, please believe me, my heart does go out. I recognize um, that every individual's hardships are a little different. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we do the best we can for the greatest good and it does not always serve everybody, um, as well as we'd like. Um, but I, I appreciate the understanding. Uh, I'm going to give one more chance for public comment. And if we do not hear from anyone, then we're going to move on, um, and try to sum this up and talk about something else. Okay, hearing none, um, thanks as Ashley and others have said for so much um, public interest and comment, we really appreciate it. Um, from what I hear, uh, it sounds like our next steps are uh, for Lane to go ahead and issue the survey. Uh, Lane is holding a, a public forum tomorrow night. Um, what, what time is that, Lane? Uh, 6.30. Okay. I'm gonna probably tomorrow morning, um, I'll resend out the links and whatnot and remind folks. I'll probably try to set up a protocol. Um, I expect there'll be a lot of questions just to make the questions um, flow a little bit smoother. So, yep, I look forward to it. Okay, and so as a board, we will continue to hear from Lane and um, you know, I, I hear everyone's interest in moving more towards in-person learning um, and you know I think that we will continue to work to make that happen when, as when we can um, and yeah so it's going to be a partnership between you know the work that the research that Lane is doing and the teachers and uh, the community as we try to make this you know happen as fast as possible. All right. Um, next in line on our agenda is a review, a very preliminary review of next year's budget, um, which, you know, because it's so early, there are many sort of concerns about or questions about is how, how this is going to unroll. Turn my mic on, budget overview. This is, should be a fairly short one. <laughs> Me too. So budget overview, again, we're early. Um, early in things, things that budgets usually get kicked off in October, you know, things should be pretty solid by the time the board votes on the budget in January. Um, oh, by the way, just so the board knows in your packet, um, that had the uh, strategic plan in there. Um, there is also an overview of the current budget we're gonna talk about. You really don't need all the details unless you want them. The bottom line is kind of what we'll focus on a little bit here, but there's also the timeline in there um, that I've mapped out um, that gets us up to the, the big vote in January you vote on, on the final budget. Um, budget goals uh, for this year going into next um, is a level service budget. Um, thankfully, um, and very thankful to the community 
uh, for the support over the last two years um, in providing us with the resources to build the supports we need to go after the ends that we spoke about a little bit earlier. Um, so going into next year, we're looking at keeping things um, level service. What does that mean? It means we're not adding staff. That's not the intent. We're not adding anything other than the things that we have to, which is usually the, um, the pay increases that are stipulated by the contracts. Um, is kind of all that we're looking at. Um, the other thing uh, that is on the agenda here is to plan for any overages, right? Any expenses that we're spending above and beyond um, this year's budget uh, due to the pandemic. In case, God forbid, the uh, government doesn't completely come through um, in supplying us with all um, that COVID is costing the district, uh, our district as well as the district districts around the state. Um, no change. Um, that's what this budget represents, except for salary lines. 2020-2021, um, uh, the year that we are currently living in, our total budget is $20,600,000. Next year, um, if we are only increasing um, what's required under the salary lines, plus an estimate of where negotiations will come out to be, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, we're looking at a total budget of $21,136,000, which is an increase of $535,000, uh, 2.6%. Okay, and that's just for salary obligations. It's adding nothing else in, which is not the intent. Unknowns right now um, that play into this is, again, we are back at the negotiating table. Um, and I'm going to suggest that we get there as soon as possible. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But we've got negotiations with the bus drivers this year, negotiations again with the support staff um, this year, and the teachers union negotiations um, for this year. When I say for this year, we got to do it this year for next year's budget. Um, the other thing that will become known in December is remember last year we had a huge budget increase. The, the majority of the budget increase was due to the addition of um, potential health insurance um, for the support staff and an HRA and a couple of other benefits that came out of the state um, negotiations with the union. In December, around mid-December, um, we should have the actual numbers of who's applying for what and what the actual cost was going to be. Um, when we started this process, the total liability, if everybody switched to the maximum plan, was about 1.3 million. We planned it um, out based upon a kind of our survey of folks, where they were at and their families, that it would probably you know, be an increase of 730,000, which is what we plan in this budget. My hope is um, that people get the health insurance they need, but it's something less than that. Um, other things uh, to consider. Um, is the cost of health insurance goes up on average about 14% per year. So that's quite significant. So that's factored into this as well. But given the impact of COVID on the health insurance industry, they may be looking for a bigger increase than the 14% that, that we've kind of grown used to. Um, can't say for sure, but again, it's one of those unknowns that's out there. But we planned in the current budget that's before you, that $535,000 increase includes that 14% that um, increased cost for health insurance. The only major initiative um, that we're going to be looking at for next year, and this will be covered under the uh, K-12 professional development budget line that, that folks were um, very generous with last year in helping us develop and add that into the budget, um, has to do with English language learners, um, English language arts, excuse me. Um, the new assessment systems that we put into place over the last uh, couple of years have identified uh, a fair problem that we need to address. What we're discovering is that students at the high school, um, there's a number of them that have significant reading delays. Um, when we took a look at that K-12 team um, that we've got, um, the real reason that we've identified and what we really feel that it is, it has to do with the, the preparation programs for elementary teachers. Elementary teachers are awesome. They do fantastic work, but the preparation programs um, don't really delve deeply enough into the special skills required uh, to teach reading. And so the plan is, as part of the, the foundational knowledge um, in English, one of the board's ends, um, is to work with the Stern Center out of uh, 
Williston, Vermont, who specializes in language acquisition. And they're going to be putting together a training plan um, for the elementary teachers as well as the special education teachers to give them those skills. Um, so that as the students are working their way up and learning through the elementary levels, um, when they get to the high school, they're on grade level or higher um, so that they can participate fully in the curriculum that the, the middle of the high school has to offer. Again, um, this is a significant cost. It'll be about 50,000 in the first year, 38,000 in the second year, and then it will go down um, after that. We still, it'll always be something because we always got to be training the new people that are coming in as we get normal attrition each year. Um, but it's a major expense for next year, but it should be encapsulated with the money that was already given for that uh, K-12 professional development budget. Um, next step in the process right now, um, the cabinet is meeting with their staff between now and the end of the month. They are reviewing the strategic plan and their own local initiatives, their own school-based initiatives um, to identify the budgetary supports that they need. We're trying to do this and accomplish this and accomplish this. Are there pieces that we're missing that will help us on that way? That's the discussion they're having. They will take a look at that um, when that list of items comes up and they will separate it into two pieces, the things that should be coming out of their own normal local budget and then the things that they might need district help with. And then I'll, I will assign um, from that K to 12 professional development line um, their needs up until the point in time that we run out of money. This should not add to the budget requests, this discussion. It's just a matter of rearranging the resources that we currently have. Uh, one of the things that we are gonna talk about, and this is important for community members and parents, and one of the things I'm gonna be harping on at my open forums, um, right up until the vote in March, is this idea of uh, reserve funds and COVID overages. Um, I am going to be asking um, both the board uh, to support me on this, um, but this will have to come down to a town vote um, to create an operational reserve fund. We currently have three or four reserve funds that are out there right now. We have one for facilities. We have one for transportation. We have one for legal. We have one for special ed. And what happens with these reserve funds is at the end of every fiscal year, if we have a surplus, the town members vote during the March 3rd vote to move that surplus money into those reserve funds so that we can use it as needed and not have to go back to the town for money um, if it comes up. I am going to be asking for the creation of an operational reserve fund so that if we are short due to COVID, I have money that I can draw from to keep the operations of the building going without running a deficit. <laughs> if it is successful, the other thing that we could do um, is use it to hopefully mitigate some of the tax burden on folks next year. We have a significant amount in our facilities reserve fund. We could move some of that over to this. Knowing that the money is there and available, we will not have to ask for as much potentially for next year's budget because we can subsidize it a little bit and get people through what is predicted to be the toughest financial year because of COVID that's next year. <coughs> so I apologize, I don't have COVID. So <coughs> I'm gonna highly recommend to the board that we start negotiations on the new contracts as soon as possible. And the reason that we do that is because every year because negotiations don't end, and this isn't the board's fault or the union's fault, it's just been timing of things. Um, every year before we wrap up negotiations and know what we're gonna have to pay in salaries, I have to predict it because you have to vote on it and it has to go in front of the voters. <clears throat> it really would be nice to know going into that vote exactly what we need so we're not asking for more than we need. Right. So part of tonight when you get to it is you're going to have the request from both the teachers union and the support staff um, to open negotiations for next year's budget. And again, the sooner we can get teams together working on that, you're going to make all our lives a lot easier. Um, <clears throat> because I always put in a standard amount. If I know it's going to be something less than that, then I'm going out to the taxpayers for a, a, a reduced amount um, when they go to vote. 
So just my thoughts. And if there's any questions on that, that budget piece at this point in time, I'll answer them. <clears throat> Are there any questions or comments from the public around uh, the budget presentation? Hearing none, uh, are there any questions from the board? Okay, let's uh, move on then. Um, all right. Uh, next, we have uh, discussion, discuss negotiations with the unions. So I saw that we were handed requests to begin negotiations by both the support uh, staff and by the teachers. Um, so we're going to, Lane, you want to talk about that? Do you want to talk about that any further than what you've already said? Uh, we should talk in executive session on the um... Sorry about that. So what I was saying is that um, I'm recommending again to the, the board that, uh, you know, they vote to open up the negotiations um, and get their teams together today if possible. And so start getting some dates together to get this negotiation process happening so that hopefully we can wrap things up before the actual budget vote in January, tight timeline, but it's doable, um, so that we know exactly what we need when we're going in to ask uh, the communities uh, for funding. You know, I'm not asking for more in anticipation of what the, the we, we, we come out with for salaries um, out of the contract negotiations. So um, let's set up the negotiating teams while we're here and discussing this. Um, we need hopefully three board members for each team, teachers and support staff. Um, speak, you know, for whatever you'd like to do. Um, that would I'm happy to work with the support staff. Okay. I am happy to stay with the support staff as well. Okay. I'm and happy to stay with the teachers. All right. Okay. All right, so um, we've got three, uh, Hannah, Brian, and Meg for the teachers, and uh, Katya, Ashley, and Anne for the support staff. All right, um, so likely we need to vote on whether we want to open the negotiations. We need to, consent. Yeah, you'll need to vote separately on each. Um, I'm going to make a further request when you get to the consent agenda. Um, actually, it went really well um, this last year. We had folks, had board members at each of the meetings. Um, but just on the off task that something blows up and it's just me sitting down, um, which has happened in the past, um, Pietro and I, if the board could vote to allow me to tentatively agree with the union, that doesn't mean it's a final agreement. It just means that, you know, if things look good and it's based upon what we've discussed, I can TA. All those agreements, when they're done and in full, they have to come back to the full board on our side for you to vote it in. And then on the union side, they have to go back to the full union. So a TA is just, you know, oh, we've reached a tentative agreement on this. It now can go to the full board for a vote. Um, All right, we'll take that up as part of the consent agenda. We'll get to that. 
Okay, so next we've got the first reading of the Title IX policy, which is a federal policy. Um, it was included in our agenda. Is there anything you want to bring to our attention, Lane? <laughs> well, lots of stuff with this one, but I'll keep it short. Uh, Title IX um, has been around for a while. It uh, protects people from discrimination and harassment based on sex. Um, it has been changed significantly, which is why that policy is so many pages long. Um, it changes the process for investigating accusations, determining the findings. It changes the length of an investigation. And I want you to think about this, the weight that's on administrators um, and other staff members from the current five to 10 days to up to 80 days. The, um, it's gonna take a significant financial out, outlay to train the staff to perform um, these functions. It's very prescribed. It took six hours for them to just talk us through the basic steps. Um, so this should give you an idea of how expansive um, this is. And if you mess up any, any part along the way, there is significant liability that will be incurred on the district. So we have significant training that we're gonna need to put in place so that all the people that are a part of this, the investigators, the deciders, um, the supervisors who oversee it all know their roles and know them well. Um, so just, just so you know, this is a huge uh, undertaking and it's gonna be a huge burden on the district. But it is what it is, it's required under federal law. The policy that you are looking at was created um, by Heather Lynn and Pietro Lynn uh, in conjunction with the Vermont School Boards Association. It's the one that they recommend. <clears throat> okay. Great, thanks. So we'll um, have time to look that over and we will approve it at the next meeting. Uh, next we've got two, uh, EL reports from Lane 2.1 and 2.2. Um, these were both first reading, so this is treatment of staff and communication with students and parents. Um, additional materials are available at the OFC office if you'd like to see uh, sort of the background material that Lane references in his report. Um, we will have a chance this month to review and then we next month. Lane, do you want to say anything more about these reports? Uh, just the basics. So the EL 2.1, as Laura said, treatment of students, parents, and community members. Um, the basics are the superintendent will not treat folks in an arbitrary or capricious way and will not seek unnecessary information from them. Um, basically, the way that you don't treat people in an arbitrary or capricious way is you follow the rules that have been set down and the protocols that have been set down by the board. Um, there have been no issues with that the one that we didn't see if i can say this right will not seek unnecessary information from them that one we have sought some unusual information this year that was out of the norm um, but it was in line with the policy um, we had to solicit information um, in terms of covid you know will you be riding the bus you know what learning modality are you open to what were the weaknesses in last year's learning modality that is not information we typically correct collect either for state reasons or um, or ends reasons um, so just to throw that out there but i um, in reporting that uh, all the provisions of el 2.1 are in compliance um, and then EL 2.2, um, Executive Limitation 2.2 is about the treatment of staff. And this is basically ensuring that we have rules and procedures um, that are understood by the staff and which are followed when we interact with them. Um, and that all comes down to all the work that we've done on contracts and MOUs and, 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 and that piece. So I report compliance on that as well. <clears throat> Unless there's questions. There's a couple of I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, no, okay. I'll definitely I'll fix them. Okay. Yeah, part of it's my old eyes. Part of it's we've been sitting at the computer for ages this year. It's felt like this year's felt like ten years. <clears throat> Did anyone attend the uh, local the VSBA regional meeting? It's okay. I I can talk a little. I can talk a little bit about it. It was actually, it was pretty low key. Um, it really only looked at two things. Um, the first half of it was really uh, just kind of superintendents and some board members talking about the work that they did to get schools reopened. 
um, you know, the, the, the troubles and the travails they faced um, and some of the unique things that they, they came up with um, in terms of being able to kind of manage things as we were open under COVID. Um, the other half was an overview from the Department of Health um, with just kind of some guidance and uh, where to find information in terms of how to respond to an outbreak if it occurs in the schools. And it was actually really good because as they were talking, um, I was able to follow the links they were talking about and I, I pulled out their, um, their plan for contact tracing, the forms that we would use, um, as well as they had a bunch of uh, letter templates, you know, um, that were written um, with the intent of going out to a community, a school community, if there's an outbreak in the school. So I found that very helpful. Uh, but it was a it was a short meeting. I mean, usually that's a two day event. This was uh, this was about what three hours, I think. So it was good. Um, in line with that, we need um, well, we need to designate um, one of us to uh, be a by visit proxy, or we can give that power to our regional representative. Is anyone interested in being our representative on those two um, sort of regional groups that are associated with the BSBA? Doesn't look like anyone's interested. <laughs> uh, it feels it going to the meetings. So it's um, the insurance bit of that and then the teachers bit. And, so it's, it's sort of representing our interests. It's, um, I've never done it. Um, they have, I think they meet quarterly. It's, it used to be in last year, now it's like Zoom, you know, so you could do it from wherever. Um, it's more sort of higher, higher level because you're, you know, governing these states, um, you know, the, the Vermont School Boards Association. Of the entire sort of yeah. Helping them focus. <clears throat> yes. Yes. I, um, a, a woman I met um, at one of the last, she's from the uh, U30 area. So, if no one's interested in attending being uh, our representative, then we will designate a proxy. <clears throat> you know, I think, yes, we used to, Anne Howard used to be the representative for many years. Well, if anyone changes their mind, but otherwise, I I'm just going to designate a local uh, representative to represent our interests, okay? All right. Um, next, we have our consent agenda. We've got minutes from the August uh, meeting and from the September meeting. We have to approve the professional contract with just a few changes in assignment. Um, I will add. Um, then we need to approve Teachers union request opening for negotiations and support staff union requests. So, why don't we take um, the minutes first? We could approve both uh, the August and the September minutes together. Does, does anyone have any substitutions or corrections on those that they've noticed as they've read them over? All those in favor? Um, any opposed? Okay. And then to approve professional contacts, they are listed in our agenda. I think they're just a couple of them. Yeah. So there's sort of a switch. Um, is there a motion to approve? We've got two um, title funded switches. They were linked to the Anna Pact. Motion. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. And then lastly, um, we approve both the teachers' union and support staff union request to open negotiations, as well as give 
lane, you call it a TA? Uh, the ability to tentative agreement, reach tentative agreements during the uh, negotiation. Tentative agreements in our stead if one of us is not present for those meetings. So I have a motion to approve those three uh, things. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right. Uh, next, we need to hear from Lane in his superintendent's report. Do you have anything to add to that or elaborate on? <clears throat> Not unless there's questions. I, I think the biggest piece was um, the legislative update. Um, right, that uh, the big bill there, that 969, that got through the house and it was signed, I think, October 2nd by the governor. Um, and so that's the one that um, did a whole bunch of things. But one of the things that it did was it rearranged the funding. Um, when they originally were going to give us funding from the, the CARES money that, that came to the state, you know, they had given us a, a certain amount for the entire state. And then we actually put in our applications saying what we had spent on COVID, they were three times too short. Um, so they actually adjusted it um, to make sure that they covered all our current requests through December 30th. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so that, that was good. Um, so the legislature has been doing... Um, a very good job and the governor as well in terms of providing us hopefully with what we need question is is when are we going to see the money <laughs> to, to help us out we'll, we'll be fine until march uh, but if we don't get something rolling in march we're gonna have to think of something else um, so hopefully they they put a timeline on it which i didn't see yeah <clears throat> And as far as financials, how are we doing this year? I guess we have some extra COVID expenses. Anything else you can notice? Uh, actually, I'll give people a quick thumb, quick way of looking at things um, real fast. Um, things are, are good. I talked with Robin. She is satisfied. There's nothing unusual happening right now, considering. Um, but if you flip to the very last page of the, the booklet, you look down at the very bottom on the far right, you see 78.69%. That's what remains in the budget for this year. Remember our budget year starts in July. So rough rule of thumb, if things work fairly linearly and they do, um, is that every three months, right? You divide 12 months into quarters, every three months um, you should be down 25%. So we should be at 75%, we're at 78.69, so we're in pretty good shape. So if you guys use that rule of thumb, if you ever see this, you know, you're halfway through the year and it says there's only 10% left, we've got things we got to talk about. <laughs> but we're in good shape right now. And that's a real easy way to tell you, um, you know, without looking in too much detail if things are on track. No, no, these numbers are with the COVID, that, that 900,000 that you had said before, that's not looking at that number. Not looking at that, yeah. Right now we're keeping it separate. So I have a question on the numbers. Yep. Um, in your report and earlier, you said that we had lost nine staff members. Um, it's, gone up. What? it's gone up, we're at 10 now. Okay, so we've lost 10 staff members. So I would assume that this actually would be less because those salaries are not being paid unless those positions have been backfilled, which didn't sound like they were. So it actually appears to me if the 900,000 is not in here, we have 10 less salaries that we're paying, which would also affect benefits, that these numbers actually aren't trending in a direction that we should be pleased about. And remember this, um, remember that this budget ended at the end of September. Um, resignations were fairly recent. Some have been replaced. Um, and in the early cases, especially, we were able to provide subs, which costs as well, not as much, but some um, in the interim. So can you tell us the positions we lost? Yeah, I actually had a sheet at least on the first nine. Let's see if I can find it. If not, I can email it to you. Actually, Linda prepared it. Let's see if I got it. Maybe this will be filled Message, efficiency, staff who resigned. 
Let's see if I not go through the names. So we had three pairs, custodian, two food service workers, a SPED teacher, uh, long-term sub, uh, another custodian, and uh, more recently a teacher. <clears throat> Without going into the names. I'd have to go back and look. I think most, um, with the exception of uh, potentially the SPED teacher. <clears throat> Again, we've only had the, the one to two teachers right now. Those are going to be the difficult ones to replace. Um, we had a lot of uh, issues early on with the support staff folks, um, especially the custodial. Um, it was interesting. Um, that was during the time that they were getting the relief funds, you know, the 600 extra dollars. Um, and so they literally were coming in and going, we're not going to, we want the job, but we're not going to go to work until the relief funds are up. And so in some cases, we had to wait a little while until those ended and then they started working for us. Um, so, but that was parents. So mostly parents, mostly in the, in the support staff um, lines right now, it'll be the teachers, it'll be difficult. Yep. And subs, teacher subs. Let me talk about substitute teachers. Is there anything else you want to add under the incidental information line? Uh, not unless there's other thoughts or questions. There's nothing new, given all that we've talked about today, at least for me. All right, Katrin, you're in charge of the board now. I got the front page down. The second side, I still have a little bit. Um, questions on. Um, so basically, five down are for our self evaluation on general meeting behavior. Again, a general plan. We followed the agenda. The meeting was very well attended tonight. We were prepared, proceeded without interruption to distractions. Um, our processes were understood. We had a lot of viewpoints. Um, I think we did a very good job, especially of allowing for an extended period of time for comments um, from the community members. Participation was balanced. Everyone listened attentively. We treated, treated each other with respect and courtesy. And we had an atmosphere of trust and openness. So yes, meet our best expectations on those. Thank you. Okay, so this public session uh, or section of this meeting is um, is over. We are going to enter executive session. So thank you everyone for attending. We appreciate it. And um, thanks, you know, continue to let us know um, of your concerns. And um, we like to be made available. We are your representatives. So thanks and have a good evening. Thank you.